good morning if you're in the US, good afternoon if you're in Ghana. Uh, and welcome to the establishing technology footprints for the advancement of agribusinesses series of workshops targeted at the inhabitants in the Ahafu region of Ghana. My name is Efia Uusufofie, and I am the founder of Coders Who Travel. Coders Who Travel is a United States-based 501c3 nonprofit organization with a vision to inspire and advance the careers of computer and mathematical programmers in less developed regions of the world. Our mission is to deliver project-based knowledge, world-class work experience, and career-defining professional communities. Our scope is on both underserved communities in advanced countries, as well as emerging regions in developing countries like Ghana. This is a timeline of the highlights of activities we have conducted since we filed for our MPO since December, 2016. Time will not allow me to touch on all of them, but certainly it has been a mix of great adventures through to 2021. Currently, we'll like to relaunch a Veterans Can Code initiative in the US and internationally extend our travels to rural towns like the Ahafu region we are targeting today. If at any point you would like to support us today and beyond, these are the multiple ways of giving to coders who travel. Your donation goes towards key items for dispatching coders and empowering a community with laptops, projectors, internet, transportation, accommodation, etc. expenses. With me today are our partner representatives, Carla Vila Lobos, representing Microsoft, and Honorable Ng Kobi Amwamensa, representing the Amen Foundation. And shout outs to our social media partners, the Insifu Group, Baobab Entrepreneur, and 2112 Charity. During the program, as you get insights, we encourage you to share on social media with your friends and family. And please monitor the chat for the relevant hashtags. And now I'll hand it over to uh, Carla and, um, and then Kobe later on. Carla, over to you. Thank you, Afia. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Carla and um, I actually work for Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft for about five years. I, I am a community development specialist and my work is uh, pretty much centered around education um, and supporting um, underserved um, uh, students. Um, I work on a team that focuses on virtual education and we do this locally, nationally, and globally. And I am very grateful to be here uh, partnering with AFIA and Coders Who Travel and to be able to support this event. Um, what we also do is connect with nonprofits um, and help them get set up with Microsoft's uh, Give Support program for matching volunteering time and donations. And we connect them with philanthropies to obtain uh, software grants and special pricing for nonprofits. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Carla. And I'm monitoring the list. Uh, we don't have Kobe here yet. Uh, so at this time, we're going to get into introductions, uh, your name, your location, and what you do. Uh, so I'm located in the U.S. Like I said, my name is Efia Usufofie, and I'm a senior consultant with Deloitte, and I'm also the founder for Kudos Who Travel, and I work on it part-time. Carla, do you want to go? Yeah. Um, I, um, again, my name is Carla. I am actually located in Maryland. Um, and for those of you don't, who don't know Maryland geographically, it's actually about 20 minutes away from uh, Washington, D.C. So I'm pretty, pretty close. Um, and uh, what I do at uh, Microsoft, again, is work with communities and um, educational institution to um, improve um, uh, digital literacy and or um, 
a support in volunteering. Um, and a lot of what I do in my personal time is actually uh, related to, um, to what I do in, at work. Um, I am a um, part-time uh, volunteer uh, for ESOL classes for adults who are um, speaking learning English for the first time. And um, I also volunteer at um, uh, senior homes. I understand that Honorable Link Kobe Amwamens uh, is on the on the on the line. So Kobe, over to you. All right. Uh, let's continue with the introductions until uh, he he gets here or gets off mute at some point. So on my screen, I see Barry. So Barry, do you wanna go? You're on mute. Thank you, Ophia. Also, I'm a Mac user and I've had technical difficulties with my coders um, background. So I apologize for that, but I am very much a member of Coders Who Travel and has served as a strategic advisor for Ophia for about three years now. My background is as a researcher in health communication, public health and data science. And one of the things that I've been able to do as a member of the board for Coders Who Travel is help formulate strategy for outreach. Um, I look at it as a health issue in terms of improving education, the mission in terms of teaching coding and programming skills to underserved parts of the world. And uh, the two are very much interlinked in terms of people's health and growth and development and cultivating uh, skills that make them competitive in the international marketplace. So one of the things I'm looking forward to speaking about uh, later today is how my background in communication theory uh, helps improve people's uh, capacity to present and talk about their narrative and their story as a way of introducing themselves into the world that is getting increasingly competitive and global. Thank you, Barry. Uh, Ransom, you're next. Hi, um, everybody. Um, good afternoon from Ghana and good to see all of you. So yeah, my name is Ransom Brown. I, I am a business development manager. I work with uh, APG Ghana and Southwest Africa. Uh, so basically I oversee um, administrative and commercial activities um, in Ghana, uh, Gambia, Sierra Leone and um, Liberia. And mainly my background is um, administrative, HR and then commercial activities. And with CODES, I am in the um, administrative department. Let me put it that way. Yeah. So that's a bit about myself. Thank you, Ransom. Uh, someone is joining with an Infinix Hot 9 play. So that's Kobe <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been here for about 30 minutes, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize. I think oh, you didn't no hear worries, us no when worries. we were calling you. So, Kobe represents the Amen Foundation. So, Kobe, uh, please do an intro. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Kobe, I'm Amen, sir. I'm founder of Amen Foundation. What Amen, what Amen stands for is Amwa Mensa Education, Nurturing, and Development. Early situated in a half a region which is in Ghana and a lot of a lot of our works concentrates on who live in areas which are poverty stricken and our, our objective obviously is to edu educate and nurture them in the areas of entrepreneurship um, education etc I believe men foundation we've been in operation since 2012. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph? Don't forget you're on mute. Hi, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon to you all. Um, my name is Joseph Lawrence Hammond. I'm a brand strategist. I'm into creative design, a UX UI designer, and uh, founder at 2112 Charity, um, a charity foundation in Kolegon, Accra. 
I work with uh, Capricorn Communications and uh, we are into PR, creatives, uh, social media, digital marketing, etc. cetera. Uh, with Codas who travel, um, uh, the creative strategist and also UX UI designer, currently working on or the lead UX UI designer for the upcoming app. That's a go for the app. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Kofi Bua is Sophie. Kofi, we can't hear you for some reason. Uh, make sure you don't have headsets plugged in or something, because sometimes I forget when I put headsets <laughs> in. Okay, let me skip and yeah, come back to you while you figure things out. Uh, we have Francis Odro. Please remember you're on mute. Hello, we're here. Hi. <laughs> it's a long time. Very long time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. My name is Francis Odru. I am a professor of mathematics. So I teach. I worked with the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences. And uh, there we tried to motivate, encourage, and empower young people from Africa to do mathematics and apply it to the solving of the problems of Africa. Yeah. I have Thank finished my contract there, so I'm back with KNUSD doing research and teaching in mathematics. Thank you, Professor Odro. Angela you. Alou, your turn. Hello, and so I have challenges um, with my video when I have the um the codes to travel background. That's why my video is not on. Angie, you can show yourself and, and get rid of the background if that's easier. Okay, so I just changed my uh, my video. I just changed my profile picture to the background instead so that I wouldn't have to show the video. I, the light is really bad in here. Okay, I think this is no, it's still very bad, but I'll just it's okay. Like okay, so um, my name is Angela Alu, and then a PhD candidate at the University of Ghana, studying finance, and then I teach at the Academic City University College, and I volunteer with Kudos to Travel. Thank you, Kofi. You said you are fine now. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all right. So uh, afternoon, everyone, morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kofi. I am a project management professional. Um, I work with, I work in a banking organization delivering projects and with uh, coders who travel. I also manage uh, projects. I think my colleague Joseph mentioned the GoForth app that we're working on, and I'm, I am, I, I, my association with Kodetsu Who Travel is to manage, help manage that project. Thank you. Thank you, Kofi. Uh, someone has the device fireflies.ai. Would you like to introduce yourself? All right, moving on. I see Lynn. And please, can you introduce yourself? And remember, you, you're on mute. Hi, thanks everyone. My name is Linda Enthiffel. I work as a communications and fundraising officer with the Tech and Entrepreneurship Hub based in Accra. And I'm just uh, assisting AFIA to uh, spread the word about this event. Uh, uh, so she's me earlier uh, as part of the Intifl group. Um, my husband also happens to be uh, part of the social media team. So together we formed the Intifl group. It's a pleasure to be part of this event today. 
Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Mm -hmm. Emanuela. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I can't turn on my camera, but um, my name is Emanuela Amachi. I am a student at Carnegie Mellon University and also a member of Codesy Travel. I would be one of the coaches or facilitators in, in the next workshop. So I'm happy to meet everyone and to know everyone here. Thank you. Uh, I see Professor Nirav Menon from George Mason. The professor hired me for my spring semester <laughs> lecturing job. Very glad to see you. Uh, thank you, Afia. I'm glad to be here. Um, uh, like Afia said, I'm a professor of information systems at George Mason University School of Business. Um, so Afia invited me to attend the session. So I'm here just to check it out. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sheila Kenlisi. Sheila, you're on mute. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Sheila Kenlisi. Um, I'm a risk management risk manager with a financial institution here in North Carolina. I'm excited to be here and get to hear and learn from everyone here. So, yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Enoch Yabua. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Enoch Yabua. Um, I work as a statistician with FISIV. Um, in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you. Thank you. Samuel, I'll see you. Hello, hi. Hi. Yeah, this is Samuel, I'll see you, a member of uh, Code Two Travel. Samuel, what do you do in your day job? I'm a software developer. I develop business applications, uh, specifically Microsoft Dynamics now. Okay, thanks for sharing. I see Benedict or Benedict. All right, Leslie. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so my name is um, Leslie. Um, I'm a software developer, also a Microsoft certified professional. Um, I got introduced recently by um, Doris Hammond, and I'm a volunteer with Codes for Travel. Thank you. Yeah. Jane Omuchekwa. Hi, everyone. My name is Jane. Um, I'm a graduate student of computer science here um supposed to be state university tennessee in the u.s and i'm glad to be here yeah thank you jane jonas let me unmute hello everyone um my name is jonas brobe i am an actuary with the standard insurance uh in america if you invited me here so i'm here to um uh, See how things go. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, Zacchaeus. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Zacchaeus Napur. I'm a front end and UX UI designer in Takradi, Ghana at Amalitu. Thank you. Thank you, Zacchaeus. Uh, Deborah. Hi everyone, I am Deborah, Deborah Sari from Accra, Ghana. And then um, with Baobab Entrepreneur, I write content for Baobab Entrepreneur. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, I see an Emmanuel trying to connect. All right. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, 
We're going to try and do something fun. But first, the agenda for today. Uh, we are doing introductions for about 30 minutes. And so we have about 10 more minutes. Uh, then we will get into key steps to starting your own business. It will be presented by Ransom Brown, Angela Alu, Angela Azuma Alu, and uh, Kwabna Ampon. Then we will dig into master working from home with Teams and Zoom. Uh, that will be led by Kofi Bua Esiofi and Ikria Osewa Ahinkra. Uh, and then possibly Selena from uh, Microsoft. Then we'll take a break. During the break, you can ask me the playlist, a song that you want me to play. And if it's on Spotify, I can play it just to keep it interesting. You can also take a break away from your PC if that's what you prefer. But those of you who want to hang out, who wants to hang out, you know, we can do that during the break. Then we'll go into make your own story in PowerPoint and Word with Dr. Barry P. Young and Joseph Lawrence Hammond. And then we are going to go get into managing your financial statement and leveraging data with uh, Sheila Kanlisi. And we we're supposed to have owner Kara with us, but he's not feeling too well. And so in place of owner, I try to dust off some skin with a dashboard and I only started this morning. And so we'll see whether the, the dashboard operates uh, given that I just picked it up this morning, but trying to fill in for owner there. On your screen, it's um, a way to annotate, uh, you know, a, a screen share. So if you go to view options at the top of your screen, you will see a list of options. You can choose test or draw or stamp or spotlight, but typically in this scenario, we are going to use text. So we've already gone over our name and job, but it will be good to see where everyone is located. Was the instructions clear for the annotate? So why don't you mark somewhere on this diagram where you are located? I expect America and Ghana, but I, I'm curious to see. We have about five more minutes. Oh, I see. I know. I think it's Rwanda. Was that you, Emanuela? <laughs> yes, that was me. Okay, great. Thank you for annotating, everyone. I see Nirop has annotated. Hearts, yes. If yeah. Yes. Do you want to give the instructions on how to do that again? Because I'm guessing probably a lot of people are trying to figure out how to do that. That's sure. Weird. So at the top of your screen, you should see view options. It's like the little the banner. It's a small banner. And then when you click on that, you click on annotate. And you will get this toolbar that you can choose. If you choose the test, you can put your name. Uh, if you choose the check mark, you can use it as it is. So when you do that, it shows up on the screen and we can tell that the action is America and Ghana. And then we have some, one person from Rwanda
Hi, if you are. Uh, hi. So I'm seeing step by step speed, step by step uh, gallery, switch video screen. So I don't know where is the annotation. Oh, um, then during the break, I will sort you out and we will do this exercise again. Noted. It sounds like special attention. Oh, it seems a lot of people had some trouble. Okay, why don't you put your location in the chat, in the chat box, if that's easier. Maryland. Ghana, Gaithersburg, Accra, Accra. Accra again, Takrade, Ghana, Accra, Ghana, Accra, Ghana. Accra again, Oregon. Oh, Shidiem, hi. We are targeting your, you and your citizenry. North Carolina, Ahafukukum, Accra, Columbus, Ohio. Hey, we have Abuja, Nigeria. How about that? <laughs> Welcome. Accra, Ghana. All right. Thank you so much for participating. I see Habib from Abuja. I don't think you got a chance to introduce yourself and Bolaji. So maybe your name and what you do will be great. I'm not hearing you well. Oh, oh I think someone needs to be on mute. Okay, Habib, if you can introduce yourself quickly, or Bolaji, can you go after Habib? Okay, great. Uh, good, this, good evening from Nigeria. Uh, my name is Habib. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I'm going to be here. Um, I particularly, what I do is that I am a web designer and, and social media strategist. So along that, I also run an NGO, uh, Digital Gem Foundation. Um, this is where we actually train youths in rural Africa community on high tea and, and leadership. That's what I, where I am. Thank you so much. And Bolaji, please go quickly so our next presentation can start on time. All right, uh, going one, two, and three. So at this time, I'm going to switch over. Ransom Brown, are you ready to share your screen? Um, yep. So the next workshop <coughs> is to start in your business. Okay, so is my screen showing now? I'm not too sure. Ransom, yes, your and screen you, is showing. You can see my screen. Oh, okay, yeah. Anyway, so um, good afternoon once again, and welcome to everybody on the platform. Uh, basically, I'm going to run through um, uh, five basic um, keys that we need to employ when we want to start uh, a business. Ransom, can you speak up a bit louder? You can, okay. Is it audible enough now? Yes. <laughs> okay, all right. So I was saying that basically I'm going to run through um, five basic steps 
uh, when it comes to starting um, a business. Um, this is not going to be exclusive. Basically, it's just to give us an idea some of the things that we need to look out for um, prior to starting a business. Of course, as we have further meetings, we'll definitely go into other areas. So my task is uh, basically to highlight on five steps. But before I do that, I would just want to briefly um, describe or help us understand. I'm sure we all, we, we know already what business, what a business is, uh, but basically for the sake of this presentation, I just want to run through that quickly. Yeah, so uh, when we're talking about a business, we are looking at um, an enterprise, we are looking at an organization, um, it could be a sole proprietorship, it could be a limited liability, whichever, so far as there is uh, um, a commercial bit, um, a profit motive, it could be non-profit as well. But at the end of the day, um, some transactions need to have taken place, of course, to achieve the purpose for which the organization or the entity was um, set up. And so before we think of starting a business, what we need to look at is to first of all do a market research. Of course, um, for every business to stand, you need to know what you, are stand, what you are going to compete against. And so you need to survey the market, looking at whatever it is you want to sell. If you want to sell um, perishables, if you want to sell um, clothing, whatever it is that you want to sell, you need to, of course, study your market. You need to know what the demand is um, for that particular market. You also need to um, know who and who is already on the market, what it is they are doing, and what it is that you also need to do differently. You need to look at what the pricing is on the market to better help you um, also understand what you are going into. You also need to look at the fiscal environment because it's not every product that can be sold at any place. And so in your analysis, in your market research, these are some of the things that you are going to look out for. And so the, the very first key thing is to conduct a market analysis that will help you find a competitive advantage for your business. And then um, having done that, you need to then put up a business plan. <clears throat> for sole proprietors, mostly they don't, um, they don't develop a business plan because they feel that, okay, I know um, I'm just selling maybe this product or I'm selling that product. And so when I talk about a business plan, I'm not necessarily referring to um, a proposal or a booklet that you have um, detailed all that you are going to do or all that you, that, that you intend to achieve with, with your business. But basically, um, you should have a plan as to how you are going to run your business. You should have a plan that will direct um, uh, your business. You should have a plan that will help you grow your business. And that's uh, when, when we are talking about a business plan, we are looking at the purpose, we are looking at the mission, we are looking at the vision, we are looking at um, uh, your strategy for marketing, and uh, we are looking at your pricing. I mean, every other thing that will help your business to grow. Um, you need to put that together. You may not be able to uh, put it in a plan and have it in a booklet that you are going to run through, but at least if you have some um, convention in your head as to how your business will go, it will also help and direct your, 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 your business. But the key thing is to, is to have a very clear vision of whatever it is that you want to accomplish as as a business. And then, um, I mean, after planning for your business, because 
after planning for your business, the next thing is to look at how to fund the business. And I'm sure once you start, um, once you have a plan, you know what a cost component will be because your plan is going to tell you where your office will be located. Your plan is going to tell you what you are going to sell. Your plan is going to tell you how much you are going to sell it. Your plan is going to tell you what you're going to get as profit at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year. And so that gives you an idea after having conducted your analysis and everything, it gives you an idea what and how you need to fund, um, how much you need to fund your business. Um, well, when it comes to, when it comes to funding your, your business, um, a lot of people will start off by going in for a loan, okay? Because maybe when they look at the capital that they need to start the business with, they obviously will not have it at hand. And so a lot of the people will just run and then go into uh, looking for loans. But the thing is, when you're looking for loans, the question you ask yourself is, um, how do you intend to facilitate that loan once you have it? And so even before you think of going for a loan, you need to ask yourself, what are some of the things you can do to get um, um, some things for free? For instance, if you want to start up a business, um, is it worth it having that luxury space? Is it worth it having that big space? You might just start off small, and it all comes from the business plan. You might just want to start off small and then grow from there. But maybe because you want to match what competition is offering, you want to um, start off with what they have already started, what, did, what they already have. In. But mind you, they started from somewhere and you are now coming to meet them. And so it's, it, it doesn't make, let me say, it doesn't make a business sense to, to, to match them right from the start. You also need to look at what you have and then start from there. So you need to start small and then build up. Um, another thing is that you also, prior to you starting the business, you also need to build um, some savings or some expenses because yes, obviously your business needs to be funded, but the, the savings and loans company or the banks or the finance company may not be able to fund 100% um, um, of your business. And so you might want to have some savings from somewhere that you can use to start off your business. Of course, when you are starting a business too, you definitely will have some friends, some family members who might want to help. And so you can also source for some funding from them. You know, so after having done all these things, you then will have an idea, whatever it is that is left that you need to add up to your business to make it um, whole to run. And so then you can look at applying for a business loan in case you need that extra cash. Um, there are also some organizations that give grants and also there are some institutions that do some uh, local funding, um, that have local funding opportunities that you might want to look at. And so um, when it comes to funding your business, um, you can have that in various forms, um, but then the, the first point of call sh shouldn't be the banks or shouldn't be the savings and loans because you are now starting the business. You don't know how it's going to end. Even though you have a business plan, things might turn out in a different way, which might not support the loan that you've gone for. At the end of the day, your profit margins may be used in paying the loan. So you might want to consider other sources of income, other sources of funding for, for, for your business. And then um, having found out your funding opportunities, you also then need to pick your business location because um, the location of your business is very, very, very important because it will determine to a very large extent the profitability and the success of the business that you are entering into. So for someone who is 
intending to sell um, yams and fish and all those uh, local products that we have here. You might first consider, I mean, operating from the market instead of operating from the mall, because you know that a lot of these people who buy these perishables will first of all go into the local markets because they feel, yes, I can get it cheaper over there. Of course, you can also have um, your shop in, in the mall. You can also, I mean, brand yourself um, in such a way that yes, people can still come. But the thing is, the first point of call will be the local markets because that is where people find it cheaper. And so if you want to start off, you want to start off with what people are used to, what people are comfortable with, what will generate um, quick profit for you, or what will help your business stand as, 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 as much as possible. So you need to really look at where your business is located. And of course, with the location of your business must be within your budget. And when you're doing that also, you need to think about both your vendors and then your suppliers, because um, for whatever you are selling, there's, there's, there'll be some people, <clears throat> sorry, there'll be some people who will be supplying you, especially with the perishables, they'll be supplying you from the farms and all of that. And you also have some people coming to buy from you as well. So wherever your location is, it should be in such a way that whoever is supplying you will be comfortable. Whoever is also buying from you will be comfortable. At the end of the day, it becomes a win-win situation for everybody. So the location of your business is also very, 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 very important. Um, another thing you need to look at in, when you are picking your location is to also consider a location that is very safe. You also need to look at a location that there's demand, like I said earlier on. And so you might first want to consider um, selling your products at the local market before maybe any other place that you think um, you can get um, sales from. Okay, so, and of course, you also will know, I mean, you also will have an idea, the best place where you can locate your, your shop or your business from your market analysis, because then that will inform your decision. That will also tell you where people easily go to get their foodstuffs from. Uh, Ransom? Yep. Pabina has joined. Pabna has joined. Oh, okay, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Pabna. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so Pabna was supposed to say something on the funding, if I'm right. Um, yeah, so maybe when I finish with the last point, then he can just um, add up to it. Okay. All right. All right. So, yeah, so again, you also need to, um, I mean, having done all that, you need to now register your business. Registering your business is very, very important. Um, but before you do that, you need to look at the business name that reflects the brand that you are creating for yourself because you, I mean, the name obviously will tell us um, the kind of things you're selling and the name will obviously carry your vision and your mission across. And so once we hear the name of your business, at least we have an idea what to expect. And you as a businessman or as an entrepreneur shouldn't also disappoint because once you pick that business name, you should make sure you work towards achieving that, um, um, that, that, that brand, you know? And so after picking the business name, you're okay with it, it's, the, it's now time to, to protect your brand. And the best way you can do that is to register it. A lot of us, we just have, um, especially the, the, the local, um, uh, sellers at the market. They just pick names on the on the on the board on on their on their shops, and they don't even bother registering it. But it's also very important. Um, that way, you know that your brand is protected. 
you know that your vision and your mission statement are also protect, protected. And so you need to register your business, obviously. Um, it comes with some other legal um, obligations that you need to look at. You need to get some licenses down, especially for the foodstuffs, um, those that will be selling the foodstuffs, you need to get your permits, you need to get your FDA um, licenses, certificates, and all of that. And again, during the market analysis stage, you will get to find out what the legal obligations are, because once you are selling um, perishables, you know that, okay, I need to have this, I need to have that license, I need to have that permit. And so whilst you're registering your business, you also need to think of getting all those um, permits because that then guarantees and that tells us that yes, you are in good standing with the business that you are operating. And that way people, you build the confidence of people um, in patronizing your, your, your products. Again, after registering your business, um, the next thing is to open a business account. Um, a lot of uh, market women and the uh, um, food staff sellers and all of that, they hardly operate business accounts um, because they feel that uh, they are mainly not that um, literate. And so most of them um, settle with the monies in their homes, in their susu boxes and all of that. But of course, having a bank account is also very, very important uh, because it will help you to manage and keep the records of whatever it is that you are getting out of the business. It will also um, help you um, get some interest at the end of the day because then if you have your, your money sitting in the bank, you know, um, you monitor the expense as against the income and that tells you what your profit levels are. It also help you, uh, helps you to have a proper um, um, bookkeeping system, if, if, if I may put it that way. And so it's very, very important that you speak to maybe a finance expert to get um, an advice on what it is that you can do to you know, get more interest at the end of the day. So basically, if you are looking at um, starting a business, you need to, um, at the foundation level, you just need to look at these five things. Um, you analyze your market, you develop your business plan, you pick a good business location. Uh, you also look at how to find your business and then you register your business and you're good to go. But before I end, I just would want uh, Kovna to come in and talk about the funding, being a funding. Thank you. Uh, so I'll go straight. So um, if you can go to the funding of business, mainly the two types of funding for a business is basically the equity and the liability. And uh, your decision for funding your business is basically will be mainly dwell on your market research. Normally, that's what I advise. If you do your market research well, it gives you an indication of the type of business you are entering into. Now, when it comes to equity, basically, uh, you are starting the business from your funds, your savings, or you get a partner. Sometimes um, we have venture capitalists that might come in on an equity front, but definitely you must know that um, a venture capitalist who at the end of the a tenure would take out his money back because he's coming in for a period, make returns and go, but he come in as an equity. So basically equity, that's, before I, let me explain it, equity ownership. So when you are starting a business, you might uh, decide to be with, start with partners, and then they all decide on equity. You decide on a share based on amount each person contributes. So that's equity. We even have some in our local balance where sometimes even in farming, you see um, the owner of the land contributing the land and then 
someone contributes labor and someone also contributes um, the money for them. Uh, the, the, then it is shared, the proceeds are shared per the percentages. So equity is there. And then liability basically could be a loan. Uh, it could be a business angel. Again, venture capitalists can also come in through liability. Liability basically, they are not coming in to own a part of the business, but they are giving you funds so that you will pay back. Now, the differences between equity and liability, major difference that with the equity, he is bearing the risk of if there's a loss, it means that he is also losing a percentage of whatever is happening. But with liability, whether you make gain or loss, you just go by the terms. So for instance, if you go for a loan from a bank, whether your business succeeds or not, you are bound by the terms and conditions of the loan that you contracted. Now, normally, when you are starting business, especially in our terrain in Africa, a lot of banks run away from granting you loans with a startup. Uh, even uh, ADB that we, we felt that was coming for agriculture are no more giving loans to <laughs> an agriculture sector. So this is the reality. Every business, especially the financial sector, run away from startups. But one of the surest way, as I said, is the equity for a startup. With the equity, the person, you are starting a business, so the person is owning either loss or gain. And so the person will put in all in his all to help in supporting your business. But in my earlier statement, I may mention the fact that your decision of choosing uh, equity or liability will mainly dwell on the market survey that, will be, that you did, which uh, Ransom has spoken at large with. Most businesses, especially in our terrain, when you are doing the market research and you are not careful, enter the market and then they will tell you, oh, this business, there's a lot of money in it, and you don't know the dynamics. You are not too sure. And so someone will advise, it is better to start with your money, equity, full, 100% equity. Know the dynamics of the business before you invite other people in. But some people are also of the thought, other philosophers are also of the thought that if the idea is very good, then go for a loan. There's other, other philosophers, that's, that's, that's their thought. But in our terrain, normally our advice that, I mean, equity is, a best option when you are starting a startup. You get to know the terrain, at least your first year, your forecast, your financial plan, your forecast, uh, you're able to meet about 50 to um, more than half of whatever you forecasted. In that case, when you are going for a loan, you have a reliable data in going for contracting a loan or in contracting a liability on a financial statement. If you don't come to this understanding and you start with a liability, if you don't take care, you end up using your financial, uh, your personal funds to pay off that loan. In that, I'm not saying that you should give up on the way, but what I'm trying to say is that it is better to be cautious, start with something small that you have, know the rudiments of the game, of the business, and then you can decide to contract a loan. But again, there are other opportunities like the venture capitalist capital there where they come in with flexible good terms. That is also an option and we need to go. Thank you. So at this time, before Ransom continues, uh, we are decided that for some members who would want this to ask their question in the native language, uh, which is, or the going language, which is chi, uh, can do so. And uh, yeah, it's a very good question. What is a venture capitalist? Uh, so Kwabna, do you want to take that? Or Angie, can you monitor that in the chat? So um, I'm going to make a plug in the native language. Obetimi akasa se se na meso mashe se metimi a manu imwaya. Ah, 
uh, Albert Owusu, Ubeti Miyakaza, or you can speak. You have to take yourself off mute first, though. Albert, I see your hand raised. Yeah, please, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you? Yeah, I was saying that uh, I'm into this wireless intercom telephone. And uh, from the analysis being given, it seems going for a loan to start a business is not advisable. So what should I do? And I heard, I see somebody typing ventures capital. And what is ventures capital? I need a, a light on that. And what should I do now? Angie, can you answer? I saw you put it in the chat. Yes, please. Yeah. OK. Hi, Albert. So I, I mentioned that um, venture capital basically refers to um, individuals or groups. So their main aim is to provide funding for startups. And um, they would usually become part owners of the business. I think Kwabnam um, explained it a bit earlier. Yeah. So in Ghana, we have the, I don't know where you are, but if you are in Ghana, we have the Venture Capital yeah, Trust. Yes, I'm in Accra. Yeah, in Accra, yes. There's a, a Venture Capital um, Trust Fund that does that. Mm -hmm. But usually you may need to provide, um, maybe you need to be registered as a business and then you need to have your documentation even before they can fund your business. Okay. Yeah, okay. and just to yeah, let me just to um, Angela. Okay. Oh, sorry. Please finish. Up. No, Ransom, you can continue. I was yeah, going to say so, that I'm just going to get their website URL and put it in the oh, chat. Oh, okay. Okay. Just to ask what Angela is saying. You know, even when you are a startup or when you're now starting up, it's very difficult to get um, loans granted from the banks and then from the savings and loans as well or other financial institutions because the, the, the risk I'm sure they will consider is very high. And so it's difficult. Even if you get some level of um, funding, it wouldn't be um, to a large extent, maybe depending on the kind of collateral you provide. And even with that, they still uh, will, will be a bit hesitant. So it's advisable to look at other areas, um, including the venture capital, um, that is, some people don't mind if other investors have a share of their business. But if you want to have your full share of your own business, then of course you need to look at other sources of funding. Otherwise, if you are open to investors owning part of your business, I think it's fine. You can go with it. Yeah, and I will add that uh, sometimes people hesitate to give uh, ownership to others because they feel this is my business and I don't want anybody to own part of it. Uh, yes. But as I heard it in one presentation given by uh, someone who has started businesses, if you think about big companies like Amazon and Facebook, currently their founders own less than 20% in those companies. But look how well they are doing and how much money they have. So if your business is really a great idea, you shouldn't really be afraid of giving part ownership uh, to someone who can really take you to the next level. Um, just to add something more to it, as, as Efia said, um, it is better to own 5% of a successful business than to own 100% of a business that's not successful. So it's a basic principle. <laughs> and then the venture capitalist normally, venture cap, as um, Angela has given you the, the office in Accra, they will ask for a proper business profiling, your business plan and everything. And then normally they look at the prospects and then they will tell you, okay, I'm investing say um, $20,000 and then we'll stay in a business for five years and then we we'll want uh, this percentage after five years, we'll take back our $20,000. And each year, as profits are being declared, they are part of the business. So you should also know that they will take their share of their dividends. So, so be told. 
So normally when you're entering a venture cap, when or when you need a venture capitalist to come in, you have to put in some structures. Uh, so you must know that. So it's a nice uh, avenue that we can take uh, note of. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so please, okay. between, uh, please, between the capital, ventures capital in loan, which one will be, will be the best? Because from your analysis, it seems you are all talking of equilateral, then getting financial support from the ventures. So in case maybe I want to go for loan, so what would be the best? Is it the ventures capital or the loan? I think, um, let me jump in again. I think the number one thing is your own personal savings, if you have, to quick start to kickstart the business. Then if you have family and friends who can give you some of their money so you return it later without interest, that will also be another nice stop. And then I would say the venture capitalist because the person investing in the business has a vested interest in it being successful, they typically give oversight for the direction of business. Probably you are a very technical person, but maybe the venture capitalist uh, maybe has an MBA or is more business savvy than you are or with marketing or something. So they not only give you the money, they give you the money, but they also give you the advice and expertise that they bring to the table. And then with the bank, uh, maybe Kwabana and the coaches can speak to it. I don't know if they give you any oversight other than you returning their money when it's due. So that, that might be the steps that Albert, I will consider. Not. Uh, Albert, just also add, um, I think that the, the, the decision, as I said, uh, it's, it's, it's basically depending on you, but the challenge that we've uh, elaborated that with the loans, the banks, as we said, most banks here in Ghana run away from startup. This is the basic truth. It is few startups they support. The bank will not come in your operations to do anything to support you with your operations. And they've given you loan and you are bound by the contract. As I said, whether you are successful or not, you, they will run after you for their money. So they don't come in as a venture capitalist to come in your management and even request for certain roles that they will fill in. For the bank, no, they wouldn't do it. So if you want the bank, this is the way. They will give the money, they don't come in and everything is your own running, but you must make sure you pay the amount in which uh, I'm saying that it is practically, uh, say 20% or 10% that you, a startup will get financing from a bank. But with the venture capital, yes, they do, or savings from a friend. And, and, and anyway, one thing I always see is social capital. I mean, in Africa, that's one of our gifts that we have, social capital, and we must make use of our friends, family. And I always say, if your friend, you don't have any friend or family to um, tap into your idea, then it's, it's, I don't see how a bank who you don't know will tap into your idea. So these are some of the options that are available. But then for the bank loan, it is very difficult in the initial stage. Every bank want to come in, and they want to deal with tried and tested businesses. But hey, there's still room, you can make it. Uh, I see Bright Bobby uh, has raised his hand. After Bright Bobby, I will allow the team to finish their presentation. Uh, these, this has been great. These have been great questions and then we'll continue the questioning later. So Bright Bobby. Okay, thank you, Evia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, everyone. My question is, um, I've heard of, uh, uh, about only 15% of startups are likely to succeed, meaning that about 75% of startups are likely to fail before the first one year or within the first one year. If that is true, what are the challenges we have as young entrepreneurs or up and coming entrepreneurs in Ghana and for that matter, Africa as a whole? What are the challenges young entrepreneurs and business startups are likely to face that will lead to this? A massive failure within the first one or three years. 
And then how we can be able to, to overcome such challenges to make startups successful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, right. Um, thanks, thanks very much for the question. I mean, um, yeah, a lot of startups will fail um, before the first year of their business because um, you'll find that if you speak with them, you'll find that most of them, sorry, most of them didn't do a proper market analysis. The, the basic is to have a proper market analysis because that way you would know, you would even know the challenges that you will find within the first one month, three months, six months, and one year of your business. You know, it will help you plan very well. Okay, because yes, every business is there for, for profit, but if you don't plan well, then you will fail. So the basic thing is to have a proper market research, is to have a proper, a clear focus on what exactly it is you want to achieve. And like I mentioned earlier on, you don't need to start up because, you don't need to start up matching up what competition is doing. You need to start up small and grow from there. You know, yes, there's competition. Um, maybe you go to a particular um, shop and they are selling all sorts of products and you might not have the capital for that. You can start with one and you start it very well. You just reinvest your profit and you continue. If you have a clear vision, a clear focus, a proper analysis, um, a well thought out plan, I, I, I don't think that within the first year you will fail. If you speak with a 15% that fails, you realize that there's something they are doing that these people are not doing, which probably will be um, the, the, the market analysis and then their commitment to succeed. I would also say it's really been popular, uh, particularly some motivational speakers will encourage you to quit your job and just launch your business. Uh, I somewhat disagree with that standpoint. I think if you have a good paying job, it's good to make some savings towards your startup dream and then slowly grow your startup. If you are fortunate to grow your startup to the point where it gives you the money that your pay job is giving you and more, that would be a good time to quit your job, but not before. That is what I will say. And the reason why you feel is, um, somebody has said that you don't have to be perfect to start, but you can, uh, you have to start to be perfect. So perfection takes time and it's like, a, a snowball rolling and gathering leaves. That's how you, you grow with, you know, launching these businesses. And uh, it takes time, you know, it's really a marathon. It's not every entrepreneur who is going to make it so quickly, like maybe the Bill Gates and the Mark Zuckerbergs, Mark Zuckerbergs of our time. But uh, sometimes that's what people see, you know, that they, they quit their college, they quit going to college to launch these businesses. And so people take drastic decisions for their small startups. I would say, uh, think of the long game and then long-term goals uh, rather than short-term uh, uh, goals that you hype yourself over that your business is going to do well because it's not just how much you wish for your business to scale, uh, but it's how much your customers or potential customers will believe in your, in, your, in your startup vision. So that's what I will add. Okay, thank you. I would also add something from which uh, I think that you've perfectly, you and Ransom have perfectly uh, said, I, I, in fact, I just, I wrote exactly the same thing. I wrote it, market survey, which Ransom, and then orientation, which you also, mentioned about you see especially in this part of our world if you don't take care most businesses when you are starting a business and everybody says i mean in our local palace with this job there's a lot of money in it 
and they don't give you the nitty gritties of this work. They just tell you that. And if you don't do a proper market survey, you pump in the money and you go and hit a rock. <laughs> then you start to ask yourself, but they told me there's money in it. But you didn't do a proper market survey. You just listen to these few good uh, uh as it were, testimonies, and then you, you say, so doing a proper market survey, taking yourself out of the survey and doing an objective proper market survey is very re relevant when it comes to startup. Very, very relevant, and it cannot be undermined. A lot of business has failed because they didn't do proper market survey. They didn't know the rudiment. You want to enter a transport business, go and speak to somebody who has been in a transport business for years. Let him tell you, how he does his supervision, what he does right. Learn, learn from listening to him, stay at the back, watch, observe, get all these things. And then you start gradually, then you understand the system. And then orientation, as Efia also said, know that, I mean, it's not all rosy. You don't start and then boom. I, you, you might have heard few things. I always say that most uh, entrepreneurs, when you are speaking to them, they tell you, they will tell you things, they jump from a point to a point. You, in between that, you don't know how they struggle. So be, get that orientation that is not easy. And no, sometimes what Elphia also said, sometimes I ask myself when I do prison, I tell people, why on earth would you think somebody like the Bank of Ghana governor should resign and then go and set up a business? Entrepreneurship. He is doing very well technically there. So he shouldn't just stand up tomorrow because I want to be entrepreneur and then resign and then go and do it. He's doing, so sometimes we must also look at these things. Maybe at a point he building, sometimes the small work that you do, it even gives you that network in starting up your business. So we shouldn't just be jumping on somebody's story and then enter into any business. Thank you. All right, let's continue the slides. And Angie, I'm sure you'll be monitoring the chat. We have a, another interesting question there. Okay, so that's actually um, the part that we're coming to, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. ransom. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. Angie, I think you can take these, right? Yes. And ransom. Actually, yeah, the Angie is the chat. Okay. Okay. So, um, Albert, to answer your question, right? We have um, we've listed some questions that can help you to, in a sense, even think about how to start your business, right? And then basically even put together um, this a semblance of a business plan. It may not be a full written out plan, but at least something that helps you to have um, a better idea of how your business is going to be like. So for instance, you have questions. Um, so these are some of the questions that we're asking that what type of business are you setting up? So what will the day-to-day -day operations be like? What are you looking at doing on a day-to-day -day basis for the business? How is the business even going to make money? Because there are so many of us, you, for instance, you offer some kind of service to people and everyone is like, oh, really, you should turn this into a business. But have you thought through exactly how you are going to charge? Because like it or not, many of us like, things, like to get things for free. Right. So have you been able to get to a point where you decide, OK, I can I would only do X, Y, Z, but if you want A, B, C, D, F, that one, I'm going to charge you for it. And then have you got people who are ready to even pay for that? What is the business model that you are going to be using? Are you going to be offering some services for free and then are you going to be charging for some others? What is your target market? Which specific people um, in marketing, they like to say that you should be able to identify a, like a specific individual. Okay, I think a 21-year-old school girl really, sorry, 21-year-old tertiary student really needs this product of mine. Or else a 24-year-old young man who likes XYZ actually needs this product. So you should be able to identify even the specific target market that um, for your product. How are you even going to attract them? What kind of adverts? Maybe these people are on social media now. So 
that will even influence the kind of advertising that you are going to do. And then you know that your business is not on its own. It's operated within an industry. So you need to find out exactly how the industry itself operates. Are there others who are providing the same kind of service that you have, um, the same kind of product or service that you have? Is there something that's going to distinguish your product? How are you going to finance your business? They've talked so much about that already. Are you going to use equity or debt? And then can you even decide on the minimum amounts that you need to start so that once you have decided on that minimum amount, maybe you can start with your own savings. So even before you are going to ask family and friends or you are even reaching out to the venture capital, there is some amount of money that you have been able to put in. Would it be possible to prepare sales projections about um, how you are going to sell the product, what pricing you are going to use? Because all of those things are very important, especially as a startup, because sometimes as a startup, you may need to price on the low side just so you can attract people to your specific product or service. Okay, and then um, some of the other things that had already been mentioned. So what name are you going to use? You should have the, the name for your business should, I mean, at first glance, anyone who hears the name should, you should have an idea of exactly what your business does. Would you be able to even outline a mission or a vision? Can you get a logo that, would clearly outline what your business stands for. Sometimes you may need to invest in like a list of core values, some things that your business will stand for. And then as was mentioned earlier to the regulation that even governs your industry, if you need to get some licenses or you need to get some permits, how, what are the things that you need to do to start? Because you don't want to start and then later on um, you are you find yourself foul of the law. It's good to find out all of those um, things before you even start. And then once you are looking at registering to, it's important to know the tax laws that govern the state and then your specific industry. Are they favorable? Sometimes there are some tax exemptions for startups, but you need to even find out so that you can take advantage of them. Do you need any certifications? Do you need them? Um, how do you get them? Sometimes you may need to go back to school to get some of those certifications just so you can start. And then have you are you incorporated already? Have you even registered the business? If you aren't registered already, what type of business is this? Because um, sometimes you may start operating, you are using a certain name, and then you don't register the business early, right? Everyone associates the name with you. And finally, you decide to register and then you find out that, that you can't even use that name. So it's important to do some of these things early. So for instance, in Ghana, you can go on the, the Registrar General's website and then do an initial name search. There's a more advanced search when you go there in person, but you can start by doing the name set just so you don't have the situation where you start using the name and then you go back later and you can't even use it at all. Um, as an institution, we do need directors because um, when you're talking about trying to even go for a, bit, a loan or making use of venture capital, they may ask for directors. Which um, people might you need to to reach out to. Sometimes people like to reach out to maybe individuals within various careers. So um, for, for instance, you may want to get someone, let's say who is in law to be part of your board of directors so they can provide some legal guidance for you. You may want to get an accountant. You may want to get someone who is quite, who has um, some IT oversight just to just so that you reduce your cost because if you didn't if once those people are part of your board then it means that they have a vested interest in the company right and then your own you yourself are part of the business so your own cv 
can you have you have your cv outlined already what experiences have you had as relates to the specific business that you want to start do you maybe need to do an internship just so you can build some experience and, and then uh, it comes to some hiring decisions is there a minimum number of people that you can start with can you do everything all by yourself right from the beginning right can you start with maybe volunteers or do you have money to start hiring right away and then um some other questions that what will happen for you if everything goes right what about if everything goes wrong do you have a plan b would you be able to recover from that and then very importantly what um, will your next steps be so after having done this kind of assessment are you ready to start or do you need to go back and then start the whole process again so these are some questions that we thought would be important for everyone who's thinking of starting a business or if you already have one it's never too late to even ask yourself some of these questions just so you can find out exactly where you are and then where you want to even go to. I thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you everybody. And uh, this is the end of this particular presentation. Thank you, Ransom. Can you put your coders who travel emails in the chat so that if okay. anyone wants to follow with you, follow up with you, they can do so? Sure, that's fine. If you if you don't remember, I can help you with it. <laughs> no, I do. <laughs> I, I, I do remember. <laughs> yeah. So Pabla, do you remember right, yours? Always. You are mute. For me, I think I, I'll need help from you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> his his email is new. Ransom allow. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so on your bottom screen, you will see reactions. So if you want to express some emotion, so click on the smiley person at the far right of your screen with a plus symbol, you, there's a clapping, there's a thumbs up, <laughs> there's a joy and uh, open mouth, there's hearts, they celebrate. So let's show some love to the presenters. All right, so we are doing excellent on time. We have about seven minutes. Uh, if there is one more question we can take, uh, uh, and then we will take a five minute break and reconvene uh, at the beginning of 12.30 uh, p.m. my time, 4.30 p.m. GMT Ghana time. Thank you, Carla. Yes, you can also show some love in the, in the chat if there are any comments uh, that you like to put in. Okay, and then beyond questions, um, if anyone maybe also has an experience to share okay. about starting, a business and then some lessons they may have learned from that as well. Thank okay, you. I see Baobab Entrepreneur has a hand up. Raised his hand. Uh, hi, Baobab. I think it's Yaya. Yeah, it's, it's Yaya. <laughs> okay. Baobab. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so uh, I think I have some, uh, I think an experience of what uh, the last presenter said about registering a business name. Okay, so uh, Bauer Entrepreneur, we are using this name for a while, and then you wanted to go and then uh, register it. When we went there, we were told that the name Bauer had been registered with a lot of names, so it was difficult for them to register because you have Bauer TV, Bauer Entertainment, and a whole lot. So it's going to be difficult for us to get the same name. So we need to struggle before they give us the name. So I think. What he said was right, and uh, I will encourage everybody to find out if a name you are choosing for your company exists. 
if it doesn't exist, then you continue to use it. Then you you try your best to register before it becomes too late. And a friend of mine too is having a half TV. And uh, for all what uh, he heard, is somebody is going to register the name and then use it for a radio television. And that have a TV, they are making a lot of series and then people are really enjoying them. So he was lucky a friend from that area told him that he need to do fast and register. So he did a very smarter way to register the name and then the man who wanted to register couldn't do it and he was able to get the name. So that's what maybe I also advise. Yeah, thank you, Yaya, great contribution. Uh, yeah, and uh, sorry, just to add um, something to what he just said. Um, as much as it is important to register the name of your business, you also would want to, to be on the safer side, you would want to have maybe um, three proposed names so that in case you go and they say this one has been registered, you have another one ready, you have another one ready. Instead of, because sometimes when you quickly have to think through and come up with a name, you might come up with a name that will not fit the brand. So you might carefully want to think through about two or three options just so that when you go, you have at least one option. to pick. We also have some feedback in the chat. Judith Abwachi says, it's also good to test the market with your product and incorporate the feedback into subsequent releases. I think she was contributing to the market research. Uh, there's Silva, he says, the hardest thing I've realized in business is managing people, getting them to work well when you need it. Any tip how to manage people? Hmm, very interesting. So I'll take a shot at it uh, because I'm the founder of Coders Who Travel. Uh, a while ago, around 2013 through to about 2015, I had a great female boss. And one of the things that I learned from her was that she was the hardest working whenever you were working with her. She was also very nurturing uh, and understood, you know, if issues came up that she couldn't meet certain deadlines. And so I realized that when you're leading people, it's not just talk, talk and creating big ideals for people to follow, but you yourself, you are trying to avoid the work. Uh, so do your work and show an example and hopefully the right people that you've surrounded yourself with will be inspired by that and they will also work hard. So that, that would be my two cents. Yes, Angie is, you know, emphasizing lead by example, because it's not what you say, it's what you do that people will do. Yeah, and I, I, I think that um, if Ifya has done um, well by at least um, giving an, an answer to that. But if you really want to manage people, it entails quite a lot, which she, she summarized. And so I'm sure with time, maybe if you is something you might want to look at, maybe. Yeah, maybe a workshop on that. On how to manage <laughs> because yeah, it's very detailed and you've done very well by at least summarizing, summarizing it for him. But just to get them to know details of it, maybe you might wonder. So, um, sorry, I, I asked this question because um, uh, I happen to be working with quite a number of people and sometimes you engage the person, then you have to drop the person, but in between your engagement with the person and dropping the person, you've lost money. And that's not probably because you don't show the example, but how to just get people to, to, to do the work. And in Africa, people like giving excuses why they can't do things. Uh, Silva, you can yes. implement a short volunteering program this is something that I, I have learned with because I work with volunteers a lot, that those who volunteer the best work the hardest when they are actually paying them to. So we can brainstorm, but I want to keep us honest on the time. I think Honorable Inc. Kobe wanted to say something. Was that right? Yes, I did. Uh, speak a bit louder. We cannot hear you. <laughs> Yes, yes, I did. I, I wanted to chip something in. All right, go ahead. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, very great presentation. Um, what I wanted to say actually was um, for, for entrepreneurs, I think that 
we should not wait for the for the right time. Um, if I say the right time, what I mean is that um, a lot of times money, you never have as much money as you want, or you never have all the resources that you need to start your business. So once you believe that it has to be done and you have actually done all the, the, the relevant checks for it, I mean, you should, you should, you should start. Um, I'm saying this along the lines of um, running about four or five businesses, which are all quite doing well. Um, being a civil engineer, managing about 40, 40 um, a workforce of about 40. So I think the most important thing I will say is that there's never the, the right time to start a business. And uh, if you wait, you'll wait forever. Yes. But Thank it's always you. good to also, yeah, it's always good to also seek advice and not be the know-all and not be the know-all. I think it's always important to seek advice, not reinvent the wheel. And um, yes, I think that's what I would want to chip in for now, yes. Thank you. And that puts us at one minute after. So we're gonna switch to the next presentation. Uh, I see that we had some new people joining us. And so because of that, uh, at every hour, we will come in and introduce the partners. So if you're joining us, welcome to the Establishing Technology Footprints for the Advancement of Agribusinesses. Ransom, can you please stop sharing your screen? Oh, oh. So welcome to the Establishing Technology Footprints for the Advancement of Agribusinesses series of workshops targeted at the inhabitants in the Ahafu region of Ghana. My name is Efio Usufofie. I am the founder of Coders Who Travel. Coders Who Travel is a United States-based 501c3 nonprofit organization with a vision to inspire and advance the career of computer and mathematical programmers in less developed regions of the world. Our mission is to deliver project-based knowledge, world-class work experience, and career-defining professional communities. Our scope is on both underserved communities in advanced countries, as well as emerging regions in developing countries like Ghana. <clears throat> this is a timeline of the highlights of activities we have conducted since we filed for our MPO since December 2016. Time will not allow me to touch on all of them, but certainly it has been a mix of great adventures through to 2021. Currently, we would like to relaunch a Veterans Can Code initiative in the USA and internationally extend our travels to rural towns like the Ahafu region we are targeting today. If at any point you would like to support us today and beyond, these are the multiple ways of giving to coders who travel. Your donation goes towards key items for dispatching coders and empowering a community with laptops, projectors, internet, transportation, accommodation, et cetera, expenses. With me, uh, our partners, my partner representatives, Carla Villa Lobos, uh, representing Microsoft, and Honorable in Kobi Amwamens are representing the Amen Foundation. Shout outs to our social media partners, the Intifu Group, Baobab Entrepreneur, and 2112 Charity. During the program, as you get insights, we encourage you to share on social media with your friends and family. And please monitor the chat for the relevant hashtags. Kobe, over to you. All right, <clears throat> thank you very much, Rose. Um, my name is Kobe Amwamens. I'm a civil, I'm a civil engineer by profession, um, but I'm um, also the founder of Amen Foundation. Amen Foundation means Amoa Mensa education, nurturing, and development foundation. Um, we've primarily been operating in the Ahafu region of Ghana, which is a very rural rural enclave um, of um, a rural enclave relying a lot on agriculture. And um, it's poverty, poverty stricken. Um, well, we have, we've been operating since 2012. And what we have actually been doing is to help educate the youth, nurture the youth in the fields of entrepreneurship, agribusiness. Um, we've run health health clinics, um, provided scholarships to the youth, and um, 
we 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 enjoy partnering partnering with other other organizations to uplift the youth out of poverty in these um agri agriculture based uh, communities in 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 Ahafo and Ghana in general thank you very much thank you Kobe uh Carla Hi everyone. Um, good afternoon. Good evening. Um, my name is Carla Villalobos. I currently work at Microsoft. I am a community development specialist and um, a lot of uh, what my work is centered on is education. Um, I work on a team that focuses on virtual education for the underserved communities uh, locally, nationally and globally. And I am extremely grateful to be partnering with uh, FIA and coders who travel to be able to support in this event. Um, we also connect with nonprofits and help them um, get set up with Microsoft's Give Give program um, that does uh, match volu that volunteers um, that matches volunteer time and also donations, and um, we connect them with philanthropies to obtain software grants and special pricing for nonprofits. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carla. Mm -hmm. So, at this time in the agenda, we are at Master Working from Home with Teams and Zoom. And the presenters are Kofi Bua Esilfi and Ikuya Hinkra. I should mention that David Abel Phillips also helped with the presentation, but couldn't be here because of a conflicting engagement. So Kofi, are you ready? Yes, if here we are. Uh, please confirm that you can see my screen. Uh, I still can see uh, Ransom's the key to starting your business screen. Ransom, can you stop sharing? All right, Kofi, now I can see your screen. Okay, all right. So uh, good uh, afternoon and evening, everyone. Um, as Afia mentioned, uh, we're gonna be discussing uh, how to master working from home. And I, I think, um, this this topic is 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 important. Kofi, hold on. Talk. I see that Stelina from Microsoft also joined. So, okay. uh, just a heads up about that. Welcome, okay. Stelina. Hello. Thank you. All right. So, um, so if you recall from Ransom's uh, presentation, the one of the key considerations you need to make as a business is where where the business is going to operate from where you're going to locate it is are you going to go and uh, hire or rent some space are you going to consider running it from home so basically those considerations are are what motivates uh, this topic uh, we believe that if you're trying to start a business and you're trying to minimize your cost maybe one of the considerations should be uh working from home especially in these times of the this COVID health uh, crisis. Um, so our aim in this presentation is to discuss, sorry one minute, how you can master working from home. Essentially, we want to try and put a definition to what mastering working from home means. And then we will look at a few tools that we believe you can work with uh, to make you effective as you work from home. So those are the two main topics or subjects we'll be discussing. And uh, please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Now, what do we mean by master from home? Basically what we are saying is how to we mastering, working from home and mastering it is being effective at it. Uh, being effective at, at it means being productive or highly or increasing your productivity whilst you're working from home. So it shouldn't be the case that because you're working from home, uh, your customers or your clients are not able to reach you at certain times of the day. It shouldn't be that because you're working from home, you miss some meetings, you miss some events, you miss some, some calls. Uh, even within your organization, you don't have the necessary engagement and coordination. So uh, a, a short definition of mastery mastery of working from home is being effective at working from home. 
Now, some of the things that, some of the tips that we want to discuss uh, as far as uh, mastering working from home include using apps to your advantage. So by apps, we are referring to applications like your calendars, your Google calendars, your, your, um, sorry, one minute. Your, your Google calendars are an example, your um, to-do lists. There are many different applications. You have Trello, you have Asana, uh, all these tools and applications on your laptops help you, Microsoft Teams, Zoom that we're gonna get to in a few minutes, all these help you to, to manage your time as you work from home. Your calendar can, set, can serve as a reminder, your calendar can serve as an update to whatever, what meetings you have booked, what client meetings, what internal meetings, what strategy sessions you have set up. So it's good to have keep an eye on uh, some of these tools uh, as you work from home. Another consideration is increase your use of video conferences. I'll combine the two, present your work with the right tools because that's basically the subject of this, this presentation. So uh, in working from home, like I mentioned, you're gonna be doing a lot of video conferencing because not everybody, I mean, you're gonna have meetings online. So you're gonna do a lot of video conferencing or audio conferencing. So you need to consider what setup you need to have to be able to, to engage along those channels. Um, it's a good idea to have a specific space in the house or home where you have designated for business. It doesn't have to be anything flashy. It can just be a standard desk and a chair, but it has to be something that even for you mentally, when you get into that space, you feel like you are in work mode rather than uh, uh, being home and at rest so that you can, you can, you can, you can, you can switch your professional lenses on and get to work. Um, you also need to have um, uh, things like um, a routine that you go through to start your day or to end your day or to get to work. All these things are things you need to practice so that become a part of you so that when you're working from home, you are effective. It's very easy to, to, to fudge the lines between home, being professional and being at home because you're home. There are lots of family distractions. There could be family distractions. There could be friends and all. So it's good to put in a, some kind of routine so that you can manage your business. Because keep in mind, what will help you sell your business is also your professional outlook. So if you don't, if you're not able to exhibit that to your clients, even to your, your employees and your colleagues, you are doing your business a disservice. Uh, I would ask my colleague, um, Ikea, she's on the call, to, to discuss the, uh, the tips from five to seven, uh, what we mean by those. Uh, Ikea, are you able to, I know you had some electricity challenges, are you able to take this? Hi, um, can you all hear me? I think yes. Um, I did join from my phone because I had some issues earlier with my machine so i would go ahead with the tips from five to six that is get ready for work create and follow a schedule and also check in with co-workers so yes as an introduction i am ikia osaywa hinka and um, i'm the co coach for uh, this particular presentation so get ready for work um kofi mentioned that being able to distinguish your personal life and um, your work, especially when you're working from home. Um, I remember when I was transitioning to remote work, the section that was very difficult is telling when you are at work and when you're actually at home because um, they are all in the same location. And one of the things that really help is being able to get up and start the same routine um, as you do when you're actually going out to work. So that would be getting up, getting ready. I know it is good mm -hmm. and the whole freedom with being in your pajamas and working is really great and very tempting. But sometimes actually going through the process of getting ready to work um, puts you in that mood where you know that you have transitioned from being at home to working. And that also helps you with your productivity and getting your mindset right. Then again, um, creating and following a schedule. So getting ready for work is good, but then being able to manage your productivity 
um, includes having a schedule. What do you do um, when you start work? Um, do you have some priorities you have to look at? Um, for me, mainly it would be starting work with setting up my priorities, my to do for the day. And these tools really help you with. I think these are some of the things that could be already mentioned. Having tools that would help you with either your to do or reminders that would um, help you with taking a break because you can sometimes always forget to take a break or even drink a water, right? Something like this, um, having tools and having such a schedule or routine is really great as well to have, especially if you want to be productive and effective when you're working from home. Then the last thing that we would talk about is checking in with your coworkers. Um, especially if you transition from working from um, an office and you have coworkers that you usually checking with or when you're in the office, you say hi to. Um, it would be great when you're working from home and you're probably alone, having in that having the same process and the home the same step. Checking with your colleagues, saying hello or hi to them. And one good tip that is also great is having lunch with your colleagues, right? You're working from home, but that doesn't mean that you can't schedule a lunch period or a lunch break with your colleagues and be online and chat the same as you would have done uh, when you were in the office. So these are some tips that we would um, just like to share with you in terms of mastering working from home and still being in the Muda professional mode and psyche when you're working from home. And Kofi, I think we can continue. Thank you, Vikia, uh, for that. Um, I would now move on to discuss some of the specific tools, Zoom and uh, Microsoft Teams, starting off with uh, Zoom. So I'm sure some of us are conversant with Zoom, but for those of us who are not, Zoom is a cloud-based video conferencing service that you can use to virtually meet everybody. Uh, it's an online, you can, you, can, you can use the service online or you can download the app on, um, on an Android or an iOS phone. Uh, some of the features that it has, and that's some of what we are using on this call, is that I'm able to share my desktop so you can see the presentation that I have. So if you are running a business and you need to make a pitch to a venture capitalist or a bank, and you need to do that remotely, you could use Zoom to meet with a person and share your presentation just like I've done. It has whiteboard functionalities so that if you have some kind of uh, strategy session, you can, you can note the discussions and the decision points. You are able to have breakout rooms. So for example, on this call, if we needed to break out into different uh, focus groups to discuss specific topics, we could do that. You can record your sessions so that you can play back later to update yourself. You even sometimes need to do that recording so you can, you can put down accurate minutes of meeting. You can do a video chat. You can do audio conferencing. You can have a virtual background. If you look behind me, uh, the background I have is, says coach uh, for coders who travel. Uh, that's not, um, actually, that's not the actual background. It's, it, I'm, behind me is a wall, but then I've, I've, I've put this uh, picture behind me. So you can do things like that. Um, you can make use of these kinds of features, for example, when you're working from home and uh, you don't really have that type of office space. Uh, and you can still get your work done. You can still put forward your best foot professionally so that you can attract investors. Um, some of the benefits that Zoom gives us is that it's easily accessible. You can schedule meetings very quickly on it. You can stream this 100%. Uh, it's very efficient and effective for getting things done. I mean. You can, you can, everybody can participate. And I think the, the session we've had today from, from about three o'clock up till now is proof of, 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 of some of the functionalities or the benefits of having an application like Zoom. Uh, we are sitting from different parts of the world. Even within Ghana, we are sitting in different cities. I'm in Accra. We have the, some of the team down in uh, Kukum, but because of this tool, we are able to meet and have this conversation and, and, and discussion and interaction. Um, so yes, that's basically what Zoom offers you. These are some of the features it has. Um, 
you can access it via the web, like I mentioned, or on Android based uh, Android or iOS based devices. You can download the app and you can use it. We have a video that I would like to put up now so that we can maybe um, IKEA can we watch it and afterwards IKEA can just give us a, a sh short uh, conversation about it. So if you give me a minute, I will just share the, I'll bring up the window and we can watch that video. Okay. Yes. Please let me know when you can see my window. We see it. Okay, so I'm going to play it now. Sorry, one minute. Hold on. Hold on. I think we have a sound issue. Let's do this. Yeah, when you share the screen, you should click on the share sound checkbox check at, the, at, the, at, the, at the Speed up coming from somewhere. Okay, your other screen is messing, making noise. Sorry. Okay, I, I think I missed what you said. Your other screen was providing echoes, so I was just alerting you to that. Okay, okay, just give me a minute. If you me... need help with playing the video, I can try also from my end. Is it working? Okay. It would be good if, it would help if you could. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to. Okay, to let me see up. if I can help. I'm, I bet, I don't know if it will work for me too, but let me see. Can you stop sharing your screen? Yes. Let me do that now. Yeah. So I've got my essay written and I've been working. Sophie, can you hear? Yes. Could you hear the sound? Yes, I could. Okay, bear with me. Working on it for about a week. <laughs> so now I'm going to show you how I use Grammarly to edit. Zoom allows you to create virtual conferences that users can join from Chromebooks, laptops, desktops, and their phones if they have the free Zoom app. To set up a conference in Zoom, visit zoom.us to sign in and sign in with your Google account or create a new one. Choose host a meeting to launch a new meeting right now on the spot instead of scheduling one for the future. Select with video on if you plan to use your webcam. If you only want a screen share, you can choose that option too. The first time that you try to launch a Zoom meeting, Zoom will need to install the app on your computer. It will download automatically, usually, and then you can just double click to run it. Once you have Zoom installed like I do, click open Zoom to start your conference. When you're prompted, choose join with computer audio. You can always mute yourself later. Here is the Zoom interface from my view. And here's what it looks like when there are other participants in the conference. We'll take the tools along the bottom from left to right. You can mute your microphone or your webcam with these buttons. Use invite to get the code and link that allows others to join your meeting. The URL or link is how most people are going to join even on their phones, but the meeting code and password provides another way to get in. So you may choose to copy the whole invitation that has the link and the meeting code and password. Then you can post that where your students or participants will be looking for it. I'll copy and paste it onto my website so you can see what information is included in the invite. Manage participants lets you mute or unmute users remove them from a conference, and adjust settings like whether you hear a chime when a new participant enters your conference. You can also adjust whether users join with their microphones on or off by default. I don't have any participants here, but if I did and needed to remove one, I just simply hover over their name, which brings up a mute and more button. And if I choose the more button, 
I have the option to remove them. Click Screen Share to share your screen. It's typically easiest to choose to share your entire screen. I have two of those, so I just need to choose the correct one. The number one on my screen up here is courtesy of Zoom, which makes it very easy for me to distinguish between my two monitors. And after screen sharing is started, I can pull up anything I want to on my screen that I want to share with my participants. And the indicator at the top of the screen is letting me know that I am sharing this screen. And this is also where I can stop screen sharing. You can also use the screen share button to share a whiteboard with your participants where you can draw freehand and add text and shapes. Again, choose stop share when you want to return to the normal Zoom room. Clicking chat pulls up the chat panel where you can message all students or use this drop down menu to send a message to just one person. Similarly, you can send a file to the whole class through chat or share with just one participant. Click File and then your desired destination. I'll choose Google Drive and select the file that is currently set to private to illustrate how Zoom prompts me to adjust the sharing settings right now so that others will be able to view this item. To return to Zoom, click either the Open Zoom message or at any time you can use the Zoom icon in your apps tray to return to the regular Zoom room if you need to. Next, you can record your meeting if desired. The indicator in the top left lets me know I'm recording and I can pause as needed. And all users can utilize these reactions icons to provide positive feedback to the presenter or to participant comments. When you're done, choose End Meeting and select End the Meeting for All Users. If you recorded your meeting, you'll get this conversion message and we'll be able to choose where the recording saves. By default, it will save to a folder in your documents called Zoom. So those are the Zoom basics. Let me know if you have any questions. Google Fi, a phone plan by Google. It's easy to switch to Fi from the comfort of your home. Hello, okay. Okay, I think you can end that. So the video is mainly to give some basics about Zoom because we just talked about Zoom being one of the tools. Um, so this is just giving you some basis on how to start a meeting and what you need to use. I know we do have some probably experience with Zoom because we are in this meeting, but um, our goal is to let you know about the tools that we can use, especially in our remote um, yeah. work. Okay, one second. Kofi, can you bring up the presentation again? Sorry, I could have to interrupt you, but. No problem. No problem. All right, so with us talking about Zoom, I think that is basically it. At the end of this presentation, we definitely have time for questions, um, if there is any. But we want to move on to the next two that we'll be discussing in this presentation, that is Teams. So that will be Microsoft Teams, which is one of the tools that would help you in working remotely. All right, so for Microsoft Teams, um, it is one of the platforms made available as part of the Microsoft 365 products, right? And it is a product from Microsoft. Um, it does have a lot of functionalities that would help you when you're working remotely. And these features include um, Teams or channels um, where your entire organization can actually converse and share information. There's also a chat function if you wanted to talk to an individual or some group instead of having to talk to the whole team. Um, there's also a chat function where you can have your private conversations as well. Um, teams being part of the Office 365 also gives you the ability to store documents. Okay, so there's a document storage section in SharePoint, um, which is a very good to a very good feature in Teams, especially being able to share files with your teammates and working on those files together with them. So that is one of the great functionalities of Microsoft Teams that I really do enjoy using. There's also the video calling and screen sharing, just as we have in Zoom. Um, you can have scheduled meetings or just start a meeting at any point in time, and all these features are available in Microsoft Teams. Um, there is also the audio conferencing calls and telephony features that are all available in Teams. We do have a video at the end of the session that would give some 
bit of information about these features and that is what we want to introduce to you. So aside these um, features that we've talked about, there are some benefits to using Microsoft Teams. And that is um, having shorter and more focused meetings. And one of the features I really like about Microsoft Teams um, is it's notification, especially when you have a meeting and it's about to end, you do get a notification as with the time you schedule. Um, let's you know that you probably have five minutes left for you to end your meeting and it keeps you really on track and being within the time you scheduled for your meeting. Um, there's also the group work simplification and I already mentioned sharing a document working together with your team on that document. And that is one of the benefits of using Microsoft Teams. So if you're starting your business or you're already working from home, um, this is one of the great functionalities that is available in Microsoft Teams that you can make use of. Um, there's also storage of att attachments. So all these I've already mentioned, but these are great benefits with Microsoft Teams. Um, aside that, there are also integrated issues with other Office 365 applications, and not just that, but also third-party apps that are available in Microsoft Teams. And To Do is one of the apps that is available in Microsoft Teams that makes it easy for you to be on track and keeping your schedule. We already talked about having a routine, especially working from home. And this is one of the apps that would help you. And the great thing is it integrates with your communication and the app that you use for your meetings. So that is one great feature. And there are many more that you can use um, with Microsoft Teams. So with that, I think I mentioned we would have um, a short video that just gives an overview of all this. So if you can you help us again? Sure. Um, I got you. <laughs> One moment. Yeah, Kofi, if you can stop sharing your screen. And. Hi there. Welcome to Microsoft Teams a collaboration app that helps your team stay organized and have Are you here? Yep. Okay, great. Hi there. Welcome to Microsoft Teams, a collaboration app that helps your team stay organized and have conversations all in one place. Let's start with what else? Teams. Here, you can see a list of all the teams you're part of. Teams are made up of channels. You can build them by topic, department, or just for fun. Channels are where the real work gets done, where you hold meetings, have team conversations, and share files. At the top of each channel, you'll find tabs. They're like links to your favorite files, apps, and services. Want to have a quick on-the-spot meeting with people in your channel? Sorry, I'm Select sorry. Meet Now. In a meeting, you can show content from your computer or record your meeting. When you share a file in a channel conversation, you and your team can edit it at the same time and share thoughts alongside it. To find all the files that have been shared in a channel, go to the Files tab at the top of the channel. To see all the files ever shared across the team, click Files on the left. Want to talk privately with a person or group? Click New Chat at the top and type their names. Give the chat a name to make it easier to find later. To make a call directly from a chat, click Video Call or Audio Call. In some cases, if your organization has set it up, you can call anyone from Teams using calls, even if they're not using Teams. In meetings, you can see everything you've got lined up for the day or week. Or schedule a meeting. This calendar syncs with your Outlook calendar. Go to Activity for a view that lets you catch up on all your unread messages, at mentions, replies, and more. And use the command box to search for specific items or people, take quick actions, and launch apps. Convenient, right? And. Don't forget to download the mobile app so you're in sync when you're on the go.
Thanks for watching. Now bring in your team and let the collaboration begin. All right, great. So that video is just a quick overview of what teams can do. And there's a lot more to that. So that is one of the tools that would help if you want to master working from home. Um, at this point, I think we do have Selena available and I believe she has been sharing some information in the chat. Um, so I would invite her to give um, any comments she has, um, especially with teams. Hey everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Selena Matos. I am a training associate for Microsoft. I've been working for the company for about five years now. Um, I have shared some helpful resources in the chat. The very first link that I provided is uh, the steps that you need to take to create a free Microsoft account. Um, if you don't have any licensing yet, you can still utilize the entire Office Suite and Microsoft Teams for free. It is going to be a limited version. Um, however, you can follow those steps. There is actually video instruction on how to create that free Microsoft account. Uh, and then the second link that I provided in the chat is taking you directly to the Microsoft support homepage. And this is for Teams. Um, this is going to have very, very helpful articles and video instructions on how to do everything in Teams, from creating a team, how to structure your channels. Um, so this is a really helpful resource to keep handy as you begin to utilize uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, and I am here for uh, any questions that you all may have for me on the application. Um, so please feel free to type those into the into the chat area. Um, but yeah, that's I just wanted to share those resources for you all to have handy. Okay, great. Thank you, Selena. Um, I think at this point, um, that would be all for the tools for mastering working from home. And we are open for Q&A questions at this point. Thank you, Ikea. So yes, uh, we can take any questions if there are. I'm going to go through the chat. I, I think I've seen uh, Leslie. OK, so Leslie's question. I'm not sure. Leslie, was this specific to Zoom or generally for each of these? I think if he has answered for Zoom. Uh, um, I think from Teams, you get an email notification when it finishes recording. And also, um, you also get a notification if you have the Teams app installed, you know, that it, it's, it's normally, saved, you know, uh, with the way, um, because it's an integrated application, it's almost always linked to a SharePoint location. Uh, oh, and okay. so it will be saved there and you can access it. But the file will be available from the same chat. And then once you click, it will go to that location and pick it up for you. So. Come on, don't be shy. And a plug in for uh, Baobab Entrepreneur. Yes, I see your hand raised. Can you come off mute? Yeah. So I want to ask, uh, let's say a company is having a license for Microsoft and then they are using the team. Can they invite somebody who is not using Microsoft to join a team meeting? That's my question. Um, I, I can address yes. that. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Selena, go ahead. Oh, I sorry, I didn't Selena. mean to interrupt you. Uh, I can no, no, adjust no, that question. Um, yes. Thank you. So for Microsoft Teams, um, if you do want to invite users that may not have a license or uh, may not have Teams downloaded, you can absolutely do that. Um, when you create your meetings, and I can actually share my screen just to demo that portion, um, just so you can kind of have a visual as I, as I walk through it. Um, as yeah. you create meetings through your calendar, sorry, I'm getting my screen up. Uh, please just let me know if you can see my screen here. We can see. Perfect, thank you. I am, I am accessing Teams from the web-based version, um, and this is the free version that you would get um, if you follow those steps in the link that I provided in the chat. Um, as you start to create your meetings, you can select new meeting here and you would want to fill out the details on this screen. I'm just going to very quickly fill out 
this and, and showcase where you can access that information. Um, so I'm just going to type in touch base. I'll leave the, the date and the time as is. And I'm going to go ahead and save that. As soon as you create your meeting, there is going to be a link that is generated for you. You can copy this link and share it off with any individuals. They do not need to have Microsoft Teams downloaded. They don't even need to have a license for Teams in order to join that meeting and participate. Um, so they can just type in, or uh, excuse me, not type in, copy and paste this URL that you provide to them in their web browser and they'll be able to join the meeting immediately um, and utilize all those great features that were kind of touched on on that previous video. So sharing their screen, um, coming off mute, typing in the meeting chat. So you just wanna make sure you share that uh, link URL that is uh, generated once you've created that meeting on your calendar. Um, and if you do utilize Microsoft Outlook, Teams is gonna sync seamlessly with it any meetings you create on your calendar is going to synchronize with Outlook and vice versa. Um, so just make sure you create those meetings and copy that link, share it off with your users, um, and just invite them to paste this into their web browser and they will be able to join you in that meeting. I hope that answers your question. Yes, but I have another question. So mm -hmm. uh, with this one, if you share your screen, can you give them control to control your screen for you? Yes, you can. So this feature, um, I do not believe is available with the free license um, of Teams, but if you are using a paid license, um, one of the features should, such as meeting recordings and, and providing control is available. Um, okay. I would just recommend if, if you are um, using the, the control, you're, you're doing it within a, you know, an environment that you, with people that you trust because you are just kind of giving them the ability to click through your screen and, and utilize that. But when you are in the meeting and you are sharing your screen, you can invite them. Unfortunately, I don't think I will be able to demo that portion just because I am using the, the free version of, of Teams. Um, but it is absolutely something that you can do. And in the um, link that I provided, the second one, in the search bar here, you should be able to type in that question. And there is uh, most definitely articles on, on how to do that within the Teams meeting environment. OK, well understood. Because my company I'm working with is using Teams. And then I know we can share with uh, other people who are not lances. So I wanted to know if with the free lances, so if the free version, you can actually give uh, control to someone, but I think you've answered my question. Thank you very much. Hey, Yaya, if you become an active volunteer at Code Azul Travel, Microsoft, and you know, I need to thank Carla and, um, and Selena, uh, Microsoft through a, a prior group have donated uh, free licenses to us in the past. So we give a license to our, our, our best volunteers. Okay, I think I've one of them and I'll get one. <laughs> because I'm already fan of Microsoft. My company is using Microsoft. And I know these things, I know a lot of it because that, that's what I use each and every day to set up my meeting, to invite people, to share screen. So I use it a lot. The whole day, I can be using Teams. So oh, they okay. So okay. I know how to use it. But no, I didn't know much about the free version. That's why I was asking the question. And I also asked the question for others to also get to know about how it's it's working it was a great question that provided a segue for selena's demonstration so thank you for asking i okay, see yeah, new people have joined since we began so if you are here and you haven't yet introduced yourself i think this will be a great time and i'm going to see if i remember judith Agboche. Hello, Afia. Hello, everyone. Hi. Your name and what you do and your role at your volunteering role. <laughs> All right. Um, so my name is Judith Habuche. Um, I volunteer with the Kodazwu travel team. Um, I should have been 
really active um in this session and for next next week's session um but generally what so what i'm into uh, i work as a risk and compliance consult um, expert um in the it financial technology industry here in ghana i'm happy to meet you all um especially the businesses coming up in the ahafo area and um, we look forward to doing great things with you here as good as we travel thank you very much thank you nabia nabia you might be on mute All right, skipping Michael Boone. And Michael, you may be on mute as well. All right. Well, how are we doing on time? We still have about 14 minutes, I believe, to spare. Uh, so more questions will be great. Other than that, we will head into a 45 minute, a 44 minute break instead of a 30 minute break and reconvene at 2 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. ET and um, Eastern time and all, let me do the math, 6 p.m. GMT. Again, Colin, Nabia, Michael, and um, okay, thank you, Selena. Luck, luck, new way, luck. You can come off mute and introduce yourself. Yes, I'm hearing. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Your name, what you do. And I think we met through Statistics Without Borders. <laughs> I, <coughs> and I, I am not moving from Vietnam. I, I come from Vietnam. I'm, and <coughs> I, I am hearing you. And I, I, I feel very, um, very honored and happy to hear some, some, uh, some sharing, your, your sharing. Uh, I have trouble hearing that. Can you come again? Uh, pardon? Can you re reintroduce yourself? I had trouble hearing you. I, uh, um, dear sir, madam, and everyone, I'm Ngoc Nguyen from Vietnam, and uh, I am a scientist. Um, I'm interested in uh, researching, uh, for example, mathematics, um, uh, optimization, computer science, and also I am a, a software developer. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So, um, I'm going to make an announcement in one of the native languages in Ghana called Chi, just so somebody who, who feels comfortable in that can also ask their questions. Uh, time, question. On our same Bisebia war. You ask me? No, not you. It was a plug mm -hmm. in an announcement for people to speak in their local, one of the local languages, if they feel more comfortable in it. No, no, no. I, I, I'm. Yes, I'm very I feel. I feel comfortable very much. I feel very comfortable with you. Thank uh, because you. Because my, 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 my English is not good. My English is not good. No worries. I wasn't. I wasn't speaking specifically to. I was speaking to those who are based in Ghana. 
and who are in the rural Ahafo region. Okay. All right. So uh, we have 10 minutes and we can head into break. Uh, remember, you can come and re request a song on Spotify and we can play it during the break to have fun and do more introductions. Or you can step aside from the screen, take a walk, do whatever helps your well being, and let's reconvene at 2 p.m. Eastern and um, 6 p.m. Uh, GMT, Ghana time. Thank okay. you all for your active participation. This has really been thrilling and fulfilling for me. And shout out on social media. Please share with the earlier hashtags that we gave. And uh, Nabi, are you back? Michael, are you back? Oh, okay, okay. So Nabia is having a challenge with her mic. She will be participating in one of the panel discussions at uh, ne next week's workshop. So uh, you'll get an opportunity to hear all the wisdom she has in that, uh, in that specific topic. All right, so see you back in 39 minutes. Oh, I see we have a guest. Is it Nairi Taylor Williams? You can introduce yourself. Please remember hello. to come up mute. Hello, Hi. hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I cannot use my, my um, camera right now. I'm not in a place that's conducive to my camera being on. No, but, that's um, fine. Yes, um, my name is Nairi Taylor Williams. I am actually from the Turks and Caicos Islands. Um, so I'm just happy to be a part of this. I was invited by um, Kwabena. We met in Leeds in the United Kingdom. Um, we were classmates for a while. So just happy to be a part and I'm um, looking forward to learning a lot from, you know, the presenters. Thank you. Thank now, you. Me, can you put your location in the chat so we capture that? Because now okay. I think we have Ghana, Nigeria, uh, Vietnam, USA, and your island. I didn't quite get it. But... Yes, I'm come from Vietnam. Yes, My country, you're coming very from beautiful. Vietnam. <laughs> I see that. I see that. All right. Uh, see you in now is 37 minutes. I'll be here playing the music and see you. Okay. Start your California road trip at visitcalifornia.com. You can request a song in the chat. If not, <laughs> I'll be playing my songs. <laughs> Was someone talking? But it couldn't feel me. I feel like this Sarkodia, a song from Sarkodia. It's what? All those uh, outside. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, can you test me on WhatsApp? Okay. <laughs> and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Hey, oh, this love.
What the mercy of God can do If you knew me then You'd believe me now He turned my whole life upside down Took the old and he made it new That's just what the mercy of God now I'm alive to tell the story How I've overcome It's His goodness and mercy And the power of His blood I'm so glad that my freedom 
wasn't based on what I've done but the goodness and mercy and the power of the blood so much power in the blood Power in the blood. There's your 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 power in the blood. There's your
This is Ice T. Stone Cold Steve Austin and Matty Ice. This is a cold call. I convinced NFL teams to turn to cold water washing with Tide. The NFL, your uniforms get dirty. Tide can handle it, even in cold. Plus, if fans join in, they can save up. Okay, we got a special request from Baobab Entrepreneur to play Hope by Sa Kodie. Baobab, I hope the lyrics are clean. We all care a lot about our neighborhood. Our neighborhood. Our neighborhood. We all care a lot about our neighborhood. Except Larry, who doesn't vote. But... Keep up my life. So I know the Bebanema Wabamu. 
Ine pindi ne mawa kumenti Ye wadini hutu na ninyame so adini ne miku anu Ibiye ni ye Sohe nudie beba ne mawa be mumbu Ine pindi ne mawa kumenti Ye wadini hutu na ninyame so adini ne miku anu Yeah. Looking for someone to take your sorrows all away One to hold you tight and say everything's gonna be okay Kind some bra we pray you now One money who now we never ya And yet the night's over try Hold on to your faith There will be a brighter day Brighter day Right here in Southwest Virginia, we're doing everything we can to keep our community safe, but extreme. Other than that, we go back to my playlist. To $150 on their energy bill. Looks like you just made the team, rookie. Turn to cold with Tide. And that's the bottom line. For great savings, buy Tide Hygienic Clean at Target. Energy savings based on average from switching from hot to cold and non HE. Facebook leads the industry in stopping bad actors online. That's because they've invested $13 billion in teams and technology to enhance safety over the last five years. It's working. In just the past few months, they've taken down 1.7 billion fake accounts to stop bad actors from doing harm. But working to reduce harmful and illicit content on their platforms is never done. Learn more about how they're helping people connect and share safely at about.fb.com safety. DoorDash helps you make cash fast. All you need is your bike and a smartphone. The sign-up process is super quick and easy. Now, you get to choose your own hours and be your own boss. And best of all, you get to keep 100% of your tips. Download the DoorDash driver app today to get started.
I'm going to play, uh, for some of you who don't know, I'm making a music album. And this is an original song. Enjoy. Journey, you 
Welcome, everyone. If you are joining us at the beginning of the hour, uh, there might be a spot for introductions, but welcome to the Establishing Technology Footprints for the Advancement of Agribusinesses series of workshops targeted at the inhabitants in the Ahafo region of Ghana. My name is Efia Owusufopie, and I am the founder of Coders Who Travel. Coders Who Travel is a United States-based 501c3 organization with a vision to inspire and advance the careers of computer and mathematical programmers in less developed regions of the world. Hold on, I need to start my video. <laughs> Our mission is to deliver project-based knowledge, world-class work experience, and career-defining professional communities. Our scope is on both underserved communities in advanced countries, as well as emerging regions in developing countries like Ghana. This is a timeline of the highlights of activities we have conducted since we filed for our NPO since December 2016. Time will not allow me to touch on all of them, but certainly it has been a mix of great adventures through to 2021. Currently, we would like to relaunch a Veterans Can Code initiative in the US and internationally extend our travels to rural towns like the Ahafu region we are targeting today. If at any point you would like to support us today, and beyond, these are the multiple ways of giving to coders who travel. Your donation goes towards key items for dispatching coders and empowering a community with laptops, projectors, internet, transportation, accommodation, etc. expenses. With me, our partner representatives, Carla Villalobos representing Microsoft and Honorable in Kobi Amwamensa representing the Ament Foundation. Shout out to our social media partners, the, the Insifu Group, uh, Baobab Entrepreneur, and 2112 Charity. During the program, as you get insights, we encourage you to share on social media with your friends and family using the hashtags that uh, the social media team will be sharing during the presentation. And so please monitor the chat for relevant hashtags. Kobe, uh, over to you. And you may have to come off mute. Yeah, hello? Hello? Yes, I'm Engineer Kobe Amwamensa, the founder of Amen Foundation. Um, Amen Foundation stands for Amwa Mensa Education, Nurturing and Development. Found, uh, and development. We primarily operate in Ahafo, that's the rural, rural part of Ghana, which is um, an an agriculture-based community. Um, we always look at nurturing the youth in terms of, and, and areas of concentrate, concentration have been education. In education, we provided scholarships for a lot of, for a significant, a significant number of youth. We've just started 
on our literally uh, our literary clubs in the community when it comes to the area of healthcare we have actually organized four health screen four health screenings and clinics whereby we provided free medical healthcare and medication for approximately 10,000 residents of the Ahafu region. In terms of skills training, we've been concentrating on and providing entrepreneurial skills and construction skills. And in construction skills, we've been concentrating on brick manufacturing and we've trained about 150 people. So for AMEND, when you say AMEND, we say passion in action. We're always looking to partner with other organizations because um, we believe in, in, in partnering with organizations to alleviate poverty in agriculture-based communities, typically concentrating on the youth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kobe. Uh, Carla, is your turn. Hey everyone, um, good afternoon and good evening um, to those of you who are just now joining us. Um, I am a community development specialist at Microsoft. I've been with the company for about five years. And a lot of what uh, my work is centered around is uh, education. Um, I work on a team that focuses on virtual education for the underserved communities uh, locally, nationally, and globally. Um, and we also connect uh, with nonprofits and help them to get uh, them set up um, through Microsoft's Give uh, program for matching volunteer time and donations. And we connect them with philanthropies to obtain uh, software grants and special pricing on non, uh, special pricing on devices. Um, uh, and I am really grateful to be here, to be partnering with AFIA um, and coders who travel and to be able to support in this event and bring awareness to this mission. So thank you, AFIA. Thank you. Uh, at this time, let me share my screen again because that always helps me reorient. So we just had a, 30, a 37 minute break uh, and now uh, we're ready for the next presentation. Make your own story in PowerPoint and, and Word. And uh, it's presented by Dr. Barry P. Young and Joseph Lawrence Hammond. Over to you, Barry and Joseph. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Victor. I'm wondering, do I- Thank uh, you, thank you. Share my screen or are you- Share your screen. Yes, so I shall do that. Just one moment. Sure. Okay. I might have to choose screen one. Whatever you do, choose. <laughs> Barry, are you there or did we lose you? I think we lost Barry. Let's give him a few minutes. Hello, Barry, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to share this screen, having a bit of technical difficulty here. Does, does everyone see my screen? Yes, we see it. Oh, okay, you see the screen, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, okay. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Barry Young. Uh, by training, I'm a communications researcher, so this is uh, a nice opportunity to be able to talk about uh, a good mentality and mindset to have whenever you're presenting your story, in this case, using particular tools like PowerPoint and Word, but as you'll find, and as you know, in the world today, there's so many tools at our disposal, so we're gonna incorporate that as well. And let me know if there's any technical issues. Uh, let me advance the slide here. Okay, everyone sees the slide advancing, Afia, we're good? Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so yes, so the title and the presentation is Make Your Own Story in PowerPoint and Word. Okay, now as we know, PowerPoint and Word are, they've been around since the 1980s. And these are very well known and very powerful tools. Usually, if you've been in the world at all and been near a computer, um, you know, Bill Gates has had a profound effect on how our world has been shaped. So you're, you know these tools very well, invariably. And they've been around for quite some time, uh, predating what we know of as the internet that we, that we use, even though forerunners that were around back then too. So what's important to note is that you shouldn't use these tools in isolation. It's very easy to think, well, I know the MS Office Suite, therefore uh, I'm gonna have the best approach to communicating and telling my story. And you certainly could do that, but you're gonna put yourself at a disadvantage. So obviously, uh, optimally, they should not be used alone. Instead, they should be used as part of an armamentarium, which is just a fancy word for the equipment you use for a certain purpose to communicate to your audience. And indeed, depending on generationally, you, that's gonna be expected if you have a crowd under 30 or under 25, they're gonna expect you to use other tools in addition to PowerPoint and Word. So the theme of what I'm talking about is using theory, which I'll get to in a moment, and then the techniques, and then the other technologies as well. But that should be your comprehensive approach to how you tell your story with PowerPoint and Word being two of the main tools, but not the only tools. Okay, so in terms of communication theory, I'm gonna talk about three theories that are good to just have in the back of your mind as kind of a foundation when you approach any kind of, any kind of um, presentation, any kind of format to reach people. So the first is what's called um, the narrative paradigm, which is actually very helpful because we're talking about telling your own, telling your story and it's in narrative form. And, there's, this is a very effective communication technique, which actually is used in many fields, politics, advertising, and what have you. Another theory is symbolic interactionism. And you might have heard this, which is how you communicate non-verbally is just as important, sometimes more important than communi communicating verbally. And this is important to know in general, whether you're using PowerPoint, Word, or a lot of things, People are gonna observe what you do and how you do it than what you're actually talking about. There's the content and then there's process. And human beings take in uh, a lot of nonverbal, which seems counterintuitive if you're using PowerPoint and Word. What about the actual content? That's fine. But the symbolic, the nonverbal is very important. And then the last theory, communication theory that's uh, important is the elaboration likelihood model which gets into different ways that people perceive and take in information. We'll talk about the central route and the peripheral route. And this has been very well studied in the field of communication. So in terms of the narrative paradigm, the theory talks about how human beings are essentially storytelling creatures. When we're disseminating information to each other, it's not just the raw, dry content and the raw. When you tell your story, in your biography, there's lots of facts that you can go down the list all day. But in order to really communicate your story, you need to have sort of an arc and a, a set of phases and chapters. So instead of using just facts and rationality and uh, logic, you want a continuous, consistent stream of experiences that tie together, that resonate, that people can follow along, almost like as if you're watching a movie and it's coherent. Now, one could say this gets a little bit cynical, like why not just give facts and that's the best way to communicate. But human beings, being what we are, the meaning-based creatures we are, we're what we like, the story form is effective. Don't just get locked into facts. Stories that resonate are believable. Listeners can start to identify and relate, okay? Getting them more on an emotional level. So examples from politics, I might be dating myself a bit, but Ronald Reagan, who had a particular economic paradigm shift, he could have talked all day about the particulars, but instead he used the notion of a shining city on a hill, okay? And Bill Clinton, if you watch the convention where he was nominated, talked about coming from a place called hope. They're not getting into such granular detail about economic and policy and political, there's some of that, but in terms of telling, Bill Clinton's telling his story 
Ronald Reagan telling a story and they're trying to convince people and persuade people, okay? So rather than get into the dry facts, they get more into a narrative. And that's something that you should be thinking about when, when presenting and using PowerPoint and Word as we'll show. Symbolic interactionism. So this gets into the nonverbal. We have symbolic behavior. Why does one wear a power top? What's the meaning you're conveying and how are people gonna interpret that? What you wear, how your garb is, what if you're in a situation, let's say you're giving a presentation, you want people to sit in a round, or you want people to be standing, or you want other people to participate. You're telling something about yourself through the nonverbal, which is going to be maybe even more effective than the verbal. Again, not just focusing on dry facts. There's a shared cultural meaning, uh, symbolically, in how you communicate. I don't know if anyone's seen the movie uh, Dead Poet Society. Again, I'm dating myself a bit. That movie goes back a ways. But in terms of communicating content that Robin Williams' character did, he would do things like stand up on the desk. He'd have the students stand up on the desk and start to see the world from a different perspective, shaking up his presentation, not just the dry stuff out of the book. So any opportunity you have to do something symbolic and something nonverbal or something that just agitates and changes pace, it's going to be more effective in how you communicate rather than just simple delivery of, of content. The last theory, the elaboration likelihood model. Now, you know, this is something very well known. It's a well-kept secret in the field of advertising. Okay. Anyway, there are two routes of, of persuasion. There's the central route and the peripheral. In a world that's completely rational, we just use the central route. When I tell you my story and I'm listing all these things, I'm saying everything about myself, but you need to have an audience that's going to be willing and able, and sometimes they're just not. Okay. There's also the peripheral route, which is... Something, let's say the difference between a debate presidentially and a 30 second commercial. What kind of imagery is used? What kind of music is put into place? What kind of symbols are used? If the, if the audience is, is somewhere else, if you use something that's symbolically or a particular emotional uh, entity happens in your story to hit on that more so than content and facts. Then if it's like, for example, I could say, hey, Afia, what is it that inspired you to create coders who travel? And Afia may share certain stories about her, her living in Africa or knowing about what's going on in the political scene. And then I'll start latching on to that. And then Afia now says, okay, this person's on the same general wavelength and the same general level of understanding or motivation that I have. Just the notion of including someone in the presentation, reciprocity. Let's get facts into symbolic. It's not just straight delivery of facts and straight stories. How your audience is going to perceive you. This influences how the audience is going to perceive you and your story. So principle design, do I hand it over to Jane? Joseph? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Okay, so I'll manage the slides for Joseph, correct? Yes. Okay, All right. Joseph, go ahead. I'll set the slide. And just okay. You know All right. Thank you very much, um, Barry. I think that was uh, insightful. I like the theories. Uh, Thank you. Well, uh, we, we, we ask this question all the time that uh, presentation is not just the content, but then uh, we, we, we also consider the, some principles and some elements in our presentations. So I'm going to touch that quickly. Uh, when we design something, uh, we definitely have to organize some elements in the design using, using the principles of design. So there are certain principles in our everyday designs that we do. Before I move to the principles, I quickly would like to talk about the elements. Uh, we have some elements that uh, we already know, like the lines, the colors in our presentations, uh, textures, our forms, our shapes, and then white space, those are uh, some, some, some of our elements. And then uh, we have our principles of design. Uh, there are lots of quite a number of uh, principles. Can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah, the next one. Next one. The next one. Thank you very much. Right, so these are some principles of design. You have your content, you want to present your company's reports. But then what is, the, what is the feel and the look of your presentation? Uh, when uh, 
our brothers and sisters presented your, your, your content, I saw a couple of things that I'm going to mention in this, my presentation. With our principles of design, we have something like the balance, we have the pattern, we have a rhythm, emphasis, contrast, unity, we have harmony, we have uh, you know, proximity, hierarchy, and, and so on and so forth. Now, when we, when we talk about balancing or balance as one of the principles uh, of design in our presentation, what's, what, is, what is all about this balance? What is all about this balancing? How do you balance in your presentation? How do you create this, this sort of uh, effect in your presentation? This typically, or this refers to uh, your visual weights of your design. So in your presentation, you have, uh, you know, symmetrical elements, you have asymmetrical elements, and then you have the radar elements. There are some elements, each shape or lines or textures that you align them equally. So those are the symmetrical elements. And we have some that you don't align them equally. Those are the asymmetrical. And we have mm -hmm. some that you align them from the center or they merges from the center. That is what we call the radar. So when you are designing, you, you try as much as possible to work with these uh, you know, elements or with these principles. You don't just put an image in your, in your slide and then, and then just leave it as it is. But then if you want to create some kind of contrast, you want to create some kind of uh, some balance in your, in your presentation, you need these uh, visual weights. And then we have um, contrast. We all know contrast, but it simply refers in our elements. It's just the difference between your elements in a design. So with your shape, what are the, uh, the contrast in your shapes? Some shapes you know, will come out you know, quite uh, faded. Some we use them as watermarks. Others, we just use the full shape. Some you crop it with a third party applications like Photoshop, Illustrator, and so on. And then you, 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 you embed it into, into PowerPoint and also placement and size of your elements. So this covers all. And then we have another one that we call the emphasis. When you are creating a presentation, definitely you, you, you emphasize on certain elements, certain images. So uh, you want to use an image as your focal point. You don't, you don't place other elements or the sub elements as, as, as they, 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 they come or they appear. But where you have your focal elements, you just emphasize on that. So how do you emphasize on your elements? You can emphasize on it by resizing it, making it a bit bigger, or changing it, adding some special effects to the image. So this talks about the, the emphasis. And then we have patterns. Um, let me use Codesu Travel uh, as an example. I, I want to design a presentation for Codesu Travel, a template. Now, as a creative strategist, what I can do, it's so simple. I don't want to be repeating the images on almost all the slides. Even if I, I, I want to have the image or the logo of Kodesu Travel, maybe the background, I'll pick Kodesu Travel image, fade it a bit, and then tile it or use it as a, as a background image. So you can create you know, a repetition of the logo as your background. So, Every time you open your presentation, you open your slide, it comes with, with, that, uh, with that image as your background. So these can be classified, or these and others are some of the principles that we have in our designs. There are, there are quite a number of them, but I just want to focus on these ones. And then uh, I'd like to move straight to color. In every presentation that we, uh, we present, or every slide that we, we present, uh, one of our main or key components has to do with color. Name or... Joseph, do yes. you, are you still on principles of design the slide deck? It looks yeah, like- You want to advance the color? I think that's another slide, Joseph. Yeah, you are talking about color, so- the... Oh, sorry. Okay, so move. I've already explained all these ones. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. Sorry. Color, okay. Okay, sorry. So sorry. Here. Is that good? All right, I'm good, I'm good, right. So uh, usually what, what happens is when you are presenting, uh, you know, you have your file, you have your document that you want to present, you have your slides. Uh, the company usually has, you know, a brand, a brand guide or a brand guideline. So you follow the brand guideline. In the brand guideline, you have the, 
the company's uh, color theme. So it followed the color theme of, of, of the company. Now, if you don't have that, that strategy, you don't have that, that, that theme, you don't have that guideline for your colors, what you need to do is to at least know your way around you know, the colors, what we know are the primary colors and how to generate other colors from the primary colors and how to generate colors from you know, tertiaries and uh, secondary colors and whatnot. So this color wheel talks about that. We have uh, the basic three colors that we all know, uh, the red, yellow, blue, and those colors are, are primary colors. And then when you mix two primary colors, you get a secondary color. So if I want to design a presentation and I want a presentation to fall within red and yellow, what I'll do is I, I will just concentrate on the, the colors or what we call intermediate colors in my two colors, my two primary colors, the red and yellow. Right, so I'll use red, I can use red orange, I can use orange, I can use yellow orange, and I can use yellow. And then we have our basic neutral colors. Those are the black and whites. You can just apply those colors to the presentation. And then on the other side too, we have uh, yellow and blue. So same applies to that. You mix two, you mix yellow and blue, you get green. You have shades of yellow and green, and then you have shades of blue and green. And then the, the other one too talks about the, uh, the blue and then the red. We have the violet and the shades uh, of red and violet. So those ones can be classified as the full colors. And then we have colors that you know, we can call the warm colors. I don't want to go uh, deeper into this. Uh, this is just uh, for the basics. So as a designer or a presenter, one of the key components that you, you focus on is your colors in your presentation, right? You can use colors to tell a story. You can use colors to work with your variations, you can use colors to work with your you know, what I've used. So you don't just pick any color and then you present it. What you need to do is just pick a color. You can also create your own color scheme. So PowerPoint, Microsoft Word allows you to create your scheme and then you go to the scheme and then you follow the scheme to create your, your presentation. Next slide, please. Right, so these are some of the schemes uh, that we have. Please go to the next one. Okay. So text color is crucial in your presentation. Please take note of that text color is crucial. So I've already mentioned that. Please don't just pick any color, follow your brand guide, consult your uh, brand manager, take the brand guide, take the colors in your brand guide and then follow it to create uh, an appealing uh, you know, slide. Please go to the next one. Right, the next slide that I'm gonna talk about is typography. We all know typography, we use typography in our presentations. And uh, we know the basic fonts, area, area black, uh, or Jerian, what have you. But when you talk about typography, um, we, we, we seem to forget uh, a lot about this typography. And then if you want to design or want to work with our presentation, we just pick any font of our choice and then we just use I. I know, uh, you know a lot of people like this Algerian. So whenever they are creating their presentation, they go for Algeria. But then uh, quickly, uh, we use typography to better convey ideas or create mood. So when you are working with your typography, it's not just uh, you know, adding text to your, to your presentation and then change the font style, the font size, and then the font color. But then if you want to create some variations, you want to create an idea, you want uh, the main heading to have, let's say, 24 points, and then the, the subheading will have uh, 16 points or so. You are creating some kind of flow, you are creating some kind of connection. So we use this typographic to do that. Now, going forward, uh, we, we have two types, I can say we have two types of this typography. We have the serifs and then we have the sans serifs. Did I have the advancing, yes. Joseph? I'm sorry. Did you want me Say to again? Did you want me to advance? Did you want me Say to again. advance? Did you want you me want to, to go to the next slide? Yes, because you're talking about fonts. I yes, just I'll, 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 I'll come to that. Okay. Thank you. Please go to the next one. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. So I was just talking about the uh, the types that we have. A typography 
uh, with this preview that we have here, we have anatomy of, a, of typography. The, the first font is different from uh, the word typography. So uh, this simply presents uh, the two types of uh, typography that we have. We have what we call the sans serifs, and then we have what we call the serifs. So uh, there are some fonts with uh, strokes. We have some fonts without strokes. So when you are designing, when you are creating a presentation, uh, you don't just pick a font. Oh, I like this. I like Times New Roman. And then you pick Times New Roman. Fonts with presentation, fonts with strokes, we have a uh, special uh, design for that. And then fonts without that too, we have that. Please move to the next slide. OK. This is an example of a serif font. Like I mentioned, a serif font has a stroke. We have Times New Roman, we have Georgia, we have the, uh, you know, just name them. Those are classified as, 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 the, as the serif font. And then we had a Gothic font. We have those without a stroke. The next slide, please. Please move to the next one. Right, we had a sans serif font. The fonts without a stroke. We had a Gothic, we had an area, we had an area black, and what have you. So those are the fonts without a stroke. Now the question is, if I want to pre, uh, you know, create a presentation, what, what is the type, what is the standard font type for my presentation? Please, the next slide. Next one. Right, please go back, sorry. Right. Now let's focus on this presentation. When you are creating presentation or working in Microsoft Word or with presentation, what we normally do is uh, we use fonts that are more readable, right? And uh, we use a sans serif font. So fonts like Arial, Vedana, and Calibri. Those fonts, they work very well, or the sans serifs and other sans serifs, they work very well in our presentations. That is why when you open, you open Microsoft PowerPoint, you have a default font to be Calibri. So it tells you that uh, this font is designed specific, specifically for presentations, on screen presentations. So sans serif fonts are good or they are well you know, created for on screen presentation. All like serif fonts that we normally use in our print. So I don't want to touch that because we use serif fonts in our print, like the Times New Roman, the, Georgia and all that. Right, next one, please. Okay, so highlighting and emphasis, emphasizing text helps the audience focus, I mean, ideas, text positioning, your function, and most importantly, it's readability. Graphics is good, but text content is the king. Now, in our presentation, we seem to add, you know, uh, a lot of uh, images, we'll go for our clip arts. And then we go for icons, and, uh, you know, and all that. But then uh, text, you can use, can create a presentation with just text. Why am I saying that? When you use the colors and then the variations very well, your text, your presentation will stand out and then you, you wouldn't have any problem with it. So when you are creating a presentation, please concentrate on your text more, where to display those highlighted texts where to reduce the font size, where to, to position it, where to balance your content and then add a text, where to have or add a caption to your, to your design. The next slide. Please. Right, now there are some golden rules in this typography or when you are creating fonts or you're adding font to your, to your uh, presentation. There are quite a number of them, but quickly I would like to take a couple of them uh, and then we just move from there. Please move to the next one. Right. Our next slide has to do with uh, one of the golden rules. It says, choose your font wisely. Now, in your presentation, you have to be consistent. If you want to go for area black, please use area black throughout. If you want to use the Dana, please use Verdana. But what you can do is you can add some dynamics to your Verdana. What are those dynamics? You can make a text bold, you can make a text italics, you can make a text small, you can make a text regular or neutral. So you don't have to use more than two 
or two to three fonts in, your, in the same presentation. You pick a, a, the Dana font, you can have the variations. Normally when I'm creating my presentations, I use one font, but what I do is I work with the, with the variations. But if you want to use more than a font, you don't have to go beyond three. You pick two fonts, cool, you pick three, and then you can work with the variations. And then you can also work with the sizes, like I mentioned, and also the color for the font. Please move to the next. Right. Go to the next, please. And then we have font personality as one of the golden rules. I believe we all have a brand personality. We have a personality as our own personality, individual personality. So as our font, if you are creating a presentation and want to have a very good presentation, you concentrate also on the personality of that uh, font. Your presentation would have to be formal. You choose fonts that will give you that formal presentation. Your presentation, presentation would have to be fun. You choose fonts that will make the presentation fun. There are some fancy fonts, but normally what happens is when you use fancy fonts and you transfer the presentation file to another computer and the computer, that new computer has the, you know, the standard font and your fancy font is not on that computer. It converts all the fancy font to the, to the standard font. So please, when you are moving the font, try as much as possible to copy or send a copy of your font to that of the new computer. So font personality is also key here as one of our golden rules. Next one, please. So these are some um, personalities. We have friendly, we have cold. Uh, you can use Calibri, you can use Georgia, Times New Roman, Vedana, Medium, Emotion. And then we have uncertain, we have uh, forceful, and so on and so forth. Please move to the next one. Titles should be big and your main text should be readable. I think I've, I've already talked about this. When you are creating your presentation, please be mindful of this. When you create a presentation, your main title should be big. Other titles should be, or other sub text, we have this, this, the standard sizes for it. So the next slide talks about that. When you are creating your font, uh, please go to the next one, please. The minimum font size for your body text and your bullets should be around 18 points. Your preferred font size for body text and bullets should be around 24 points. And a preferred font size for heading or titles should be 36 to 44 points. So you see, there's some kind of uh, variations in this. So let's say I have the Dana as my main heading, my sub would have the same Vedana, but I'll reduce the size. And then I have the body, body will have the same Vedana and I'll reduce the size of the, of the, of the font. And then there, I would have some italics, I'll have some, uh, some styles, I'll change the colors, have some variations, maybe red, shade of red, tint of red, intermediate, and then work with it. Right, next one, please. Make your heading stand out by using a larger font. So I just said that with your body text being not too much than 18 points. All right, next one, please. Right. It seems when, we, when, when we're working with presentations, we, we try as much as possible to, uh, you know, to make all our contents more visible. So we end up by changing the font to all caps. I've seen a couple of presentations with that. So I'm saying just go easy on those caps. When you're working, Caps works well in titles, or if you want to use them in your designs and all that, or you want to emphasize on a couple of texts, you can use the caps, but not the entire text, the entire document. You don't have to use all caps for your document. We use caps to emphasize or to create, to lay more focal you know, uh, indicators in our presentations. So when you are creating your presentations, please be mindful of the caps. Don't just use the caps and then make all the tags bold. Don't be shouting at your audience with your, with your text. You have the caps, you have all caps. It, it creates those uh, you know, emotional effects to your audience. When you see the, the text with all caps, you know, it, it, it shouts at them. So please don't do that. If you make everything bold, nothing is bold. So that's my message for you. You make all the text bold, nothing is bold. So just create some variations. You have the... Uh, some key sentence, some key component in your presentation, 
try as much as possible to emphasize on that, highlight it. Some people underline it, that's fine. Make it bold, can it even increase the size for that text alone? The next one, please. Right, so I'm saying let your text brief. That's one of the golden rules. When you are creating a presentation, in our principles of design, I mentioned um, space, what we call a white space. When you are designing, we have uh, positive and negative uh, you know, areas. The positive areas are where you place the content and the negative are the opposite side or what you call the inverse. So when you are creating your designs, you create it in a way that the, the, the positive, you know, the, the negative will not dominate the positive. However, the, the negative should also balance or should, 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 should be in line with the positive. So in our text, in our presentations, in our Microsoft Word, we have something that we call leading. Leading normally creates spaces in between your paragraphs. So when you are creating your text, please try as much as possible to create spaces in your paragraphs and also track or create spaces in between your, your characters. So you can track it, you can track by creating spacing between your characters, you can also track or create canning uh, spaces in between your words and your characters as well. So please allow your text to breathe. Don't be you know, uh, putting all the text together and then creating you know, a difficult uh, you know, uh, uh, text. The next one, please. Now, we have graphics and illustrations. You have a presentation. They want to uh, make the presentation a bit you know, appealing. You want to add some graphics to your presentation. Uh, at this point, I know PowerPoint comes with uh, the default clip arts, but the question is, you don't have to use the predictable clip art. When your, uh, your audience see, uh, you present a slide and they see the slide, the audience can predict that, oh, this slide will come with this clip art because that is what is it's, it's installed in your PowerPoint. But then you can go beyond that. We have other photo editing applications that go to Google you download images. Just move to Photoshop or Illustrator and then work with the images, add some retouching effects, enhance on the images, and then move them back to, or save them as PNG and then move them back to, uh, to to, to PowerPoints. Now, if you want to save an image, you can, uh, without a background, you cut it out and then save it as PNG, as a portable network graphics. That image uh, format comes without a background. So you don't have your images saved with a white background as uh, normal JPEG files. So uh, you can have that. If you're also good at uh, working with some animations, you can create your frame-by-frame -frame animations with other third-party uh, applications and then import them or add them to, to your presentations. So simplify rather than complex. You don't have to place too uh, many pictures or graphics in your presentation. Icons, normally when I'm creating presentation, I create my own icons. I use the brand guide, I create, uh, you know, I follow the guide, so I create the, my own icons and I use icons in my presentations. So please simplify rather than complex. Don't stretch photos from sides, as they don't stretch photos from sides. When uh, Kofi, Kofi, are you there? Okay, quick one. When Kofi presented, uh, I think one of the slides, I saw a compressed picture, and I was I was struggling to you know to to have a, a bite of that image. So when you are when you are resizing or scaling your image, please try to pull from the corners to constrain the image. Use the corners to come. I don't allow or import or add pixelated photos. And uh, yeah, that's it. So when you're working with your images, please Thank follow you, Seb, I'm here. Oh, Kofi, I just mentioned your one of your slides. It has a compressed, it has a compressed photo. Yeah, Thank Kofi, you very I much. saw it and I wanted to change it, but <laughs> I couldn't find that's the picture fine. That's on fine. the internet. So okay. So uh, in a nutshell, I can say uh, we've learned something learned about the principles, learned about typography, the colors, the color scheme, learned about the graphics, how to work with illustrations, and what have you. So these are just the basics. I'll hand over to uh, my, my champ, Barry. Barry, it's your okay. turn now. Thank you very much, audience. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Okay, so the um, final part for our presentation is talking, getting a little bit into presentation techniques. 
So one thing you wanna focus on is making sure that your presentation doesn't come across as one dimensional. There's a lot of possibility to make things a little more interactive. And in doing so, you're gonna activate more sensory channels for your audience member and it'll affect them more deeply. You know, in the field of education, there's seeing, there's hearing, there's touching, there's showing examples. You have to sort of come from many angles or triangulate or, or whatever other, how many other angles to attack to reach your audience rather than just making it one dimensional and narrow, which is easy to do if you're just using PowerPoint and just using Word in the traditional way they were used for decades. And again, um, and Joseph was alluding to this a bit in terms of how you're presenting it, it's gonna have an effect on your audience and how they react. One of the challenges in general, when you communicate in general, you wanna strike that balance between boredom and sensory, sensory overload. You don't wanna underwhelm or overwhelm your audience in conveying your story. So we talked about typography, color theory and scheme, the layout and positioning. Just talking a little bit now about the use of hyperlinks and animations and then balancing being concise with the content you have and also a little bit on data visualizations to get that happy medium between boredom and sensory overload and being interactive. So in this case, hyperlinks are really something you should look to do when using either PowerPoint or Word. And you know, they, there's, it's no accident they afford these possibilities. It's not an accident, they have it there. So you can take a, a, a quick sojourn to like LinkedIn, to a LinkedIn link, or perhaps going to a quick uh, link on YouTube. Uh, I've seen, I've done this when teaching at, at universities where you're doing a lecture, then you throw in a YouTube clip or some clip for just a few minutes to make it in vivo very quick so that you are going to give a little bit of elaboration to your audience rather than just content, 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 and just pure text. And the visual medium should be varied rather than a static presentation of slides. So, you know, an example of that, let's say, is the coders who travel. Okay, if I wanted to elaborate a bit, I would have quick link to the website and reading about that, quick link to Afia's biography, okay? And any other video content you wanna do rather than just slide after slide. And you're using animations and hyperlinks to catch the audience member's attention and PowerPoint and Word really, as I said from the beginning, should be used as a springboard for other programs. And as we'll see in social media, other sites as well. Now, this is important. Use these features judiciously. If you get excessive with the animations, it could prove distracting and undermine the effectiveness of your presentation. People don't necessarily want to see gimmicks and whiz bang stuff. You know, we all see, okay, you know how to use this particular dissolve feature or entrance or en exit feature. But if you overdo it, then it's just a little bit of a, you know, it looks silly rather than, and it undermines the gravitas of what you're trying to do. And again, this is a very common problem, more common than, than we would care to acknowledge. A lot of people will throw the kitchen sink at someone. They want to convey a lot of stuff in a slide. And then we see basically the Encyclopedia Britannica up on a slide. This still happens. I don't know why, but it does. For example, this is from the, uh, I think from Fia's LinkedIn page or the coders page where I wanna talk about it. So boom, I wanna get everything down. The audience member looks at this in a PowerPoint and says, you know, they'll start to turn off. Do not force the audience to read a great deal. That defeats the purpose of PowerPoint. This causes fatigue and boredom and it dissipates your points. People do not respond well to have the kitchen sink things thrown at them. This does really very little for the audience and you're gonna undermine whatever your emphasis, you know, what your preferred emphasis on. And just a quick example is, okay, let me choose, let's say six bullets that capture a lot of the essence of that big content we had previously. Okay, now I, this may seem obvious, but you know, as my mother used to say, common sense isn't so common sometimes. It's very surprising how people will still say, well, I wanna get all this out there. And then when they do, ironically, it undermines what they're trying to talk about. PowerPoint, again, as a, to crystallize. And then as we talked about, it's good as a springboard to other things. And same with Word as well, when you're doing a particular uh, outline or executive summary, okay? You have to keep in mind your audience members' attention span and patience. Now, data visualization is a huge and growing aspect of a huge and growing field called data science, which is getting in everywhere. And when you want to convey a point and convey a story, 
anyone who's ever used Tableau or Power BI, there's a constant talking about storytelling, telling story with your data. And your own personal story can be that way as well. Now I can talk about, let's say the relationship between where you live and your happiness. I can give all sorts of facts and figures. I could use everything in a very linear way, or and this is from Gapminder, which is a terrific uh, website that does all sorts of data visualizations. I can present something like this. And as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And what kind of variables and visualizations are gonna be best to tell your story? You could easily have two different axes about you know, a year in your life and how much you experienced certain you know, medical conditions or athletic experiences or whatever. Don't be afraid to use a data visual tool, a data viz uh, type tool, Tableau or Power BI, just an example. Google Studio does stuff. Don't be afraid to put that into your PowerPoint, to put that into a word presentation to help tell your story. Because again, I'm already mixing it up as I've done before, I'm doing it now, where I'm now looking at something that's speaking to me without words. I'm using hyperlink, I'm using pictures, I'm telling that instead of just the litany of, of text. Okay, the final point I wanna look on is uh, social media because, and this, this phrase is a little bit irritating, but it is true, your personal brand. That sounds a little bit slick. It's too much from advertising, but invariably people are gonna identify you with a brand. Okay, uh, Coders Who Travel has a particular theme of being a nonprofit, of being internationally socially minded, educationally oriented. What is the brand of Coders Who Travel? What's the story of it? And, you know, Afia and, and her story, and because and, and she's the founder. So this is how you communicate the story. You got to be aware of the social media opportunities. People sometimes use avatars. We'll talk a little bit about whether that's a good or bad thing or the pros and cons and then storytelling in real time, the malleability. So uh, it's expected these days that you should be talking on many platforms. And this gets to my first point, which is that if you just use PowerPoint and Word, chances are, especially if you're, let's say your audience is under 30 or 35, you're gonna be seen as a little bit outdated, a little bit archaic in how you're communicating. It's like, there's all these other possibilities and these platforms are linked and you're encouraged to use them uh, with each other. Now, avatars can enhance your appeal. It could have some kind of extra taste and flavor and interest, but it could easily come across as cartoonish and distracting. So you have to use that judiciously. Now, you know, I've heard from people that, let's say in a job search, something like a Twitter can be something as useful as a LinkedIn. Uh, and that Twitter is a great way of telling a story in a brand. It's one of many many channels to look at. For example, okay, this is the kind of stuff that people are gonna expect you to do on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Where is your presence? PowerPoint and Word as a springboard connected to those things. And people are gonna look, look for that after a presentation. They're gonna look for that after you, you convey something. Well, where are you on that platform? The PowerPoint and Word should be a springboard to that. If those things are missing, if you're not mindful of where they are, uh, that people's eyes are going to be there, then invariably you're going uh, to create a bit of a void for people. And they're not going to know as much of the story as you would like them to. And you might think, well, I told my story. I did PowerPoint and Word. Where else are you? Again, PowerPoint and Word as that springboard is key. And uh, that pretty much concludes it for now. So thanks. On mute. You're on mute. Okay, thank you, Barry. Barry, usually I'm telling people they're on mute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's easy. Thank you, Barry and Joseph. Wow, I thought I learned a lot. I do ah. see one question already. It says for okay. someone, this is from Nahabia, okay. for someone now starting out, how can one develop the brand guide? That is choose colors. Okay, thank you very much, Nadia. Um, you know, brand guide, it's not only for the color scheme. It, it has a lot of components. So as a startup, you can have, a, you have your logo. Now, before you even create a logo, there are colors that are designed specifically for uh, certain, you know, uh, projects. 
when you take a, a scheme, a color scheme like shades, shades of blue, all right? Uh, that shades of blue talks about, uh, it's a color, color of trust. So you can see uh, with uh, social media giants like Facebook, uh, our tech, tech giants like Dell, uh, Intel, Microsoft, what I've used, they, 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 they use the color blue and it works with the shades. So the colors that we have, the shades, the, the colors we have, they, they, they are designed specifically for uh, certain projects. So if your company or your startup, it's under, let's say, um, you are into uh, groceries or let's say you do uh, something that has to do with, uh, you know, the, ecolo uh, the, the, the ecological design kind of thing. Right, definitely you have to choose the green shades, okay? So the green shades, are we, as we all know, the color of growth and health. So when you are using green, then you are talking about growth and you are talking about health. Now, as a startup, brand guides are quite expensive. So if you want to, if you want to hire, you know, a creative strategy to get your brand guide, you know, it's quite expensive. Uh, but then you can have just a mini brand guide from your logo. So first of all, you have a logo, you have colors for your logo. Now, what are the, 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 the story behind those colors? You choose red for your, for your logo. What, why did you choose red? You need to explain all that to be able to get a good brand guide. So if you want to go further on this, if you want to get a brand guide, I believe you can, you can share uh, your, uh, your brand identity with me. Then I'll advise you on how you can go on that to get a, a very good uh, you know, guide. Not just the color, even a typography, there are fonts that are designed specifically for certain projects. So if you are into, uh, let's say, aquaculture, you don't just choose any font, okay? We have some fonts that they, they, they best suit in that, in that category. So uh, do get in touch and let's, let's talk about it. And then maybe I, I will get you a, a mini brand, brand guide for that, okay? That's German. Okay, I don't know what's happening, but there are echoes suddenly when I speak. So anyone, everyone should put themselves on mute unless they have to talk. Uh, one more question. We have about four minutes. We should have been in our break by now, but uh, we, we did learn quite a bit. Uh, I would also want to give opportunity to some people who just join us. I see new, new names. Michael Boone, if you are here. Michael Jandu, uh, Francis Arthur, Kwabina Ibrahim, Daniel Boche. Uh, just your name, what you do, and maybe how you found out about the program. Yeah, great. Uh, hey, Afia. This is Hi, Michael. Hello, everyone. Um, this has been lovely. Thank you, Microsoft, for putting this on. As Sophia said, I've learned quite a bit myself. I was taking notes on the bullet size point, so this is great. Um, I work in product uh, for NVIDIA, and I'm um, happy to be here. I've helped uh, coders who travel, coders who travel uh, previously in a number of capacities, and Afia is my friend, so happy to be here and support, and of course, learn. So thank you for, for inviting me. Yeah, and this presentation was actually from coders who travel members. So they don't well, want to take their shine. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. For, for, for sure, for sure. All yeah. right. Any, um, I'll just, if I'll just say one other quick thing too, if, you, if anybody is developing within the computer vision space, feel free to reach out. You can uh, ping me offline. Thanks. All right, Michael, thank you. Uh, Francis Arthur. Hey. Um, Hi. Nice seeing you, Afia. So I'm Francis Arthur. I'm an IT professional. My specialty is in infrastructure and then cloud um, infrastructure, both on premises and on the cloud. I am kind of delving or switching to cloud security now, but it's not full yet. But for now, I'm on infrastructure and um, both on-premises and cloud security. How did I find out about this? If you sent me a meeting request and I accepted, sorry, I couldn't join much earlier. I had other engagements, but since I offered to join, I, I had to keep my word. So yeah, here I am. 
Thank you, Francis. Leslie, Tonyu. All right, Daniel Boche. Okay, uh, sorry, Leslie, you can come back. Yes, um, I've, I've been on already um, from the beginning. I introduced myself. I'm Leslie. Oh, Tonyu. sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Just, yeah, sure. Daniel Boche, if you haven't already introduced yourself. Well, yeah, my name is Daniel Boche, and I'm uh, uh, the group chairman of Warbita Group, uh, a resident in Ghana. I was invited by uh, Joseph Lawrence. And... All right, thank you for coming. And we have one minute to transition to the next presentation. Uh, Sheila. Are you ready to share your screen? Um, if you am ready, give me All right. And uh, Sheila, I actually forgot that we had to do the final announcements of the three organizations. So as you get ready, I'm gonna share my screen one more time and introduce the partners. And um, so okay, I'm, sharing, I'm sharing my screen. You can go ahead and do the introductions then I can start. Okay, uh, do you see my screen? Cause I'm also sharing. Oh, oh, I stopped sharing, sorry about that. No, that's fine. So if you just join us, we are now gonna head into the managing your financial statements and leveraging data section. Uh, as I mentioned, Sheila will be handling the financial statements part. We expected owner Kara, but he's running to a personal emergency. And so this morning I, had to think of something to fill the gap. So I'll be presenting on the fly. And so bear with me uh, if there are any glitches. And for those of you who've been saying you wanna be founders and entrepreneurs, that's one lesson. You know, when there's a, a personal emergency or inability of a, a colleague to show up, how prepared are you to cover their tracks? That's a good sign that you probably want to be a founder. Uh, so at this juncture, uh, welcome again to the establishing technology footprints for the advancement of agribusinesses series of workshops targeted at the inhabitants in the Ahafu region of Ghana. My name is Efio Usufopie and I am the founder of Coders Who Travel. Coders Who Travel is a United States based 501c3 nonprofit organization with a vision to inspire and advance the careers of computer and mathematical programmers in less developed regions of the world. Our mission is to deliver project-based knowledge, world-class work experience, and career-defining professional communities. Our scope is on both underserved communities in advanced countries, as well as emerging regions in developing countries like Ghana. This is a timeline of the highlights of our activities we have conducted since we filed for our NPO in December 2016. But time will not allow me to touch on all of them, but certainly it has been a mix of great adventures through to 2021. Currently, we would like to relaunch a Veterans Can Code initiative in the US and internationally extend our travels to rural towns like the Ahafu region we are targeting today. If at any point you would like to support us today and beyond, these are the multiple ways of giving to coders who travel. Your donation goes towards key items for dispatching coders and empowering a community like laptops, projectors, internet, transportation, accommodation, etc. expenses. With me, our uh, partner representatives, uh, Carla Villa Lobos representing Microsoft 
and Honorable N. Kobi Amwamensa representing the Amen Foundation. Shout outs to our social media partners, the Insifu Group, Baobab Entrepreneur, and 2112 Charity. During the program, as you get insights, we encourage you to share on social media with your family and friends. And please monitor the chat for the relevant hashtags. Kobi, if you can hear me, over to you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, um, I'm Engineer Kobi Amwamensa. I'm the founder of Amen Foundation. Um, Amen literally means Amwa, Mensa, Education, Nurturing and Development. Uh, foundation. Um, we've been operating in the Hafa region, which is a rural, which is a rural enclave in Ghana for the last, I mean, as of 2012. Um, Ahafo is primarily an agricultural based um, region. Um, poverty stricken, high rates of youth unemployment. So what we do is um, to focus on education, healthcare, um, and other issues. Um, and bottom line is to help improve the livelihoods of, 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 of the unemployed youth. We've been involved in numerous activities, um, pro provision of scholarships um, to, to smart kids. We've also carried out health screenings, catering, I mean, looking after about 10,000 residents of Ahafo providing free healthcare and medication. We always look forward to having great partnerships. And uh, honestly, it's been it's been a blessing today. Um, I don't know if I should add I should add this this part. It's, it's been a blessing today because of where we are located. It's <laughs> getting the caliber of um, expertise that we're having today. It's literally. It's like a miracle. So um, we thank, we thank, um, we thank um, Codes Who Travel, Microsoft, and and everybody here for letting this thing happen. So we say amend and we say passion in action. It's about the passion and it's got to be in action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kobe. And uh, you're welcome. You're very welcome. Uh, Kobe is actually my cousin and we all ah. hail from... <laughs> we all hail from uh, at the Ahafa region by virtue of our parents being born there. So uh, this is a great opportunity. Uh, and we plan to go to everybody's hometown if their opportunity avails itself, because we are coders who travel and we like to travel. Uh, Carla, <laughs> your turn. How, how can I follow that? I mean... <laughs> 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 we're, we're, we're not cousins we're brothers and sisters <laughs> <laughs> yes you are you are a sister, <laughs> <I'm a> sister. <laughs> um well uh welcome everyone uh for those of you who are just joining us uh good afternoon good evening um i am with microsoft and i am a community development specialist and um it is amazing to be here um and to be uh, partnering with AFIA uh, and coders.org uh, to, uh, to really support this mission. Uh, but um, part of what I do at Microsoft is uh, centered around education, um, education for the underserved communities locally, nationally, uh, globally. Um, and we also connect, uh, we also help on uh, nonprofits connect with our Microsoft Give program. Um, in uh, matching volunteering time, donations, and uh, we connect them with philanthropies to obtain uh, software grants and special pricing for nonprofits. Um, so, uh, Afia, thank you for having me here. This is this is a great experience. You're welcome, Carla. And now we are ready for managing your financial st statements and leveraging data. Uh, Sheila. Hi, Afia, I'm here. I'm gonna share my screen. But before that, oh my God, Afia, it's been such an amazing time this afternoon with everyone. I've learned so much and I hope 
everyone here has learned a lot because even just from listening to Barry and Joseph's presentation, just listening to them, I had to go back and look at my slides and say, okay, can I apply some of the things that um, they were talking about? And I was able to go back and I audited my um, slides and I was like, hmm, I think I, pretty, I did a pretty good job. So uh, Barry and um, Joseph, I'd like to get your feedback on my slides as well. But <laughs> as always, there's always room for improvement. No right? problem, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we saved the best for last, which is hey. talking about <laughs> financial statements and data. Those are the two most exciting topics in the world. I'm sure half of you are rolling your eyes going, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> so I'm going to try and make this as exciting as possible, talking about finance and talking about um Balance sheets and income statements are not the most exciting things, but um, there's so much we can learn from um, financial statements. So when Efia asked me to present on um, financial statements, I figured, um, why not? And also just as a um, disclaimer, when I put these presentations together, my focus was on the individuals who were in the um, Ahafo region um, given that, um, so what I did was I tailored it and I made a presentation a little higher level than usual. So at the end of this, um, financial, a lot of colleges spend months, sometimes even a whole semester on financial statement. So this is an abridged version of a financial statement. Um, my intention is to give an overview of what financial statements are and what they look like, what are the key components and key elements in a financial statement. Um, definitely open to questions if anybody has any. So um, to get started, what are financial statements? So basically, financial statement is a reporting of a business's financial activities. It helps you understand how the company is doing, how the company is performing. So um, like um, I think it was Barry in his presentation, he said during a presentation, it's not what's in, what's on the screen. Financial statements also do tell you a lot. You can attend a conference, you can attend meetings, listen to CEOs talk about their companies. But if you read a financial statement and you look into that, sometimes it can tell you a whole different story. So it's very important for us to be able to understand what a financial statement is. And as an entrepreneur, um, having financial statements help you understand your financial strength, how you're doing as a company. Um, typically in the US and in other countries, um, a lot of publicly um, traded companies are required to file a financial statement. So as a small business, you may not, once you haven't IPO'd or gone public, there isn't that requirement to have financial statement, but it's still good. It's still a good tool for you to see the financial health of your company. Um, a lot of financial statements, when they are written, there's usually um, written according to certain financial um, accounting standards. So in Europe, and I believe in Ghana, um, we use the IFRS, which is the International Financial Reporting Standards. In the US, they have to use the generally accept, um, accepted accounting principle, which is the GAAP. So those are the principles that help determine how um, the financial statement should be written. And once for, again, for financial um, um, companies that are publicly traded, they typically would be required to be audited because an auditor has to audit their financial statement to show that the company is representing accurately um, the information that they have in there. So um, that's, that's in a nutshell what financial statement is. Um, to prepare a financial statement, there are so many tools out there. In the past, a lot of folks would have your accountant will have a, have a piece of paper, draw the lines, and write all your accounts, your assets, your liabilities. But in, in, in today's world, there are so many resources out there, and some of them are even free resources that you can use to prepare a financial statement. 
So in keeping with the um, title of this um, session, wanted to introduce some example um, resources that you can use in um, preparing your financial statement. So there is QuickBooks, which is one of the most common um, application or um, system that folks use in a lot of small businesses and even some mid-sized businesses use, or even big companies too, would use their QuickBook in um, helping them create their financial statements. You can use also Microsoft Excel um, to help you draw your financial statements. There's also Google Sheets that you could leverage um, and other um, resources out there. So they are always, if as a small business entrepreneur, if you wanna develop your financial statement, sometimes it's as easy as just going into Google, Google financial statement. There are so many resources out there to help you. There are financial statement templates out there and you can start with an Excel, a basic Excel um, um, function and just put in your tables and start work um, putting together your financial statements. So today I wanted to talk about the three main or three popular um, primary financial statements that a lot of companies have. So there is the income statement, there is the balance sheet, and there's the cash flow. So the income, the income statement basically is tells you about the financial performance of the company, which is really your profit and loss statements. There is the balance sheet, which tells you the financial health of the company. Then we have the cash flow statement, which tells you how you are managing your cash inflow and cash outflow for your company. All these very important um, um, tools and resources for, um, for you to manage your um, financial performance of your company. Okay, so on the next slide here, I just talk about, I pulled together those three and I included a fourth one, which I would not be spending a lot of time talking through. Just wanted to bring, um, create that awareness that there's a fourth one, which is a statement of equity. This statement of equity is just showing um, the stakeholders, the change in their retained earnings or the beginning equity and ending equity for a period of time. So um, just wanted to introduce that there's a fourth one, but the three primary ones are the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. Okay, so starting with the income statement. So like I said, the income statement basically is a summary of your business revenue and your expenses over a period of time. So unlike a balance sheet, which is as of a period of time, the income statement is telling you how you're doing, like the income you are making at the end of a particular period. So for instance, what I put together over here was just a basic income statement. So I know there was a guy um, who talked about um, when we started early on, was it um, Albert Ousu, who said he had a cell phone business that he was thinking about um, wanting to understand um, the whole um, venture capital funding and also um, versus getting a loan. So if I'll bet you are on here or anybody who is on here, who is a small business for your income statement, right? So the first piece is we need to understand what revenue we are making. So for instance, if say, um, let's say we have an individual, Mr. Kofi Mensa, who has, who wants to, who has started a business. He um, spends 50 Ghana cities to go and buy. He wants to get into cocoa farming. So he spends 50 Ghana cities to buy the cocoa seeds. Then at the end of the season, he makes 2000 Ghana cities. So the money after he's harvested and um, sold the cocoa seeds to whoever is making the purchases, and he makes that 2,000. So that 2,000 Ghana cities that he's making from the sale of his cocoa beans would be classified as the revenue. The cost of goods sold basically is the cost of the, um, how, how much it cost him to get those cocoa beans. So that's what we reference here as a cost of goods sold. So after that, you subtract your revenue, your cost of goods sold, from your revenue to get your gross profit. 
So the gross profit is okay. Before we factor in expenses, this is how much we've made from the 500 CDs um, cocoa beans that we um, purchased. Then he probably spends say 300 Ghana CDs on labor. Um, at the end of um, the once you do that, you subtract your expenses from your gross profit. That will give you your operating income. Once you have your operating income, next is you subtract your interest income or if there's any taxes that you need to subtract from um, any tax taxes that you've had to pay, then you come up with your net income. So this is a really basic high level example of an income statement that an individual who is starting small business owner can utilize. For any of these areas or these component elements in here, we can dig deeper, there are, there's more to it. But from a high level, I wanted to introduce to you um, what an income statement looks like and what are the key elements that goes into an income statement. Okay, moving on to the next um, item that I wanted to introduce here was the balance sheet. So over here, like I said, the balance sheet is as of a setting as of a setting date. So think of a balance sheet as um, remember in Ghana growing up, we have the seashore where one person sits on one on one side and another person sits on the other side, and you keep trying to balance going up and down. So um, the balance sheet is very similar to that. So what it's showing is is your assets and your liabilities. So your assets will be sitting on one end of the balance beam and that your liabilities have to sit on the balance beam will be on the opposite side. You typically want both the left side and the right side to balance. So what does the asset part entail? So the first, the left side is your assets, which is your total assets. Within assets, you have your current assets and your long-term assets. So what do I mean by current assets? Current assets are um, those assets that, like cash, that you could always convert to, um, any, or like anything, any asset that you can convert to add, um, cash within a year. So anything that's liquid. So think about cash being one of, one of those. Inventory. So inventory is if you have um, your cocoa in stored in storage and something should happen and you need money quickly, you're able to sell those, that, um, those bags of cocoa quickly to make money. If you have supplies, you have certain things that you can quickly sell them and make money, or you can quickly get money out of those things, turn, or turn them around and make some money. Those, those are items that are classified as your current assets. Then we have the long-term assets, and those are the items that is, um, you cannot easily, it's a little harder to convert into cash within a year. So say some of your long-term investments, your property, plants, equipment, which could be say the land that you have, you're selling, you have your, um, you have like 20 acres of land, you run into trouble, you need money quickly. You wanna sell five acres. Sometimes it's, it might take a year or two for you to get a buyer. So those big ticket things that it's not easy to convert to cash quickly. Those things are termed as your long-term assets. So I have here examples of that to the right side of my screen. Then um, to the next, so we just talked about the left side of the balance beam. So to the right side of the balance beam, that's where you have your liabilities. So we have on that side, there's the liabilities and your stakeholders equity. So what I, what's your liabilities and what's your stakeholders equity? Then within the liabilities, liabilities are pretty much things you owe. So assets on your left side are things you own, right? I own something, you own your cash, you own your inventory, you own your property, your land, your equipment. Then liabilities on your right hand side are things you owe. So monies you owe people. So that's what you always wanna make sure that your assets and your liabilities are balanced. So um, focusing on liabilities, 
So there are two terms, there are two parts to liabilities. We have your um, current liabilities. Those are things that you need to settle within a year. So um, as a cocoa farmer, you need to pay um, your employers. You probably owe some money that you still haven't paid for. So liabilities are things you owe. So those are your short-term or current liabilities. Then you have your long-term liabilities are um, monies that you have to pay within a longer um, period of time. So that'll be your long-term um, loans. So for instance, you go to the bank and ask for a five-year loan, right? For say 1 million Ghana cities. So that's a long-term liability. So then afterwards you calculate your total liabilities. Then the next, the second part within the right side of the balance beam is your equity. So within equity, yeah, equity will include like your capital contribution. So um, if you guys remember at the beginning, um, again, going back to Albert's question, as a small business owner, what should he do regarding getting cash to fund his business? Is it better to go to the bank and get a loan or is it better to get equity and I think you guys did a phenomenal job in explaining to him the importance of trying to um, use equity to fund your business so equity Dila, be, yeah uh, just one double check is this the correct slide yes okay so okay that's a good question so I just finished talking about the income statement that's okay. this one right here Okay, so I just okay. moved on to the balance sheet. Okay. And I talked about the current assets and long-term assets. Okay. I also talked about the current liabilities and long-term liabilities. So I just moved into equity okay. right here. Um, if yeah, you just made me realize that I failed in my presentation. <laughs> no, no, no. And, um, <laughs> Joseph's presentation, if you couldn't follow. I'm in I'm, trouble. I'm with you. <laughs> what did um, Joseph that day is long I'm for here. me too so maybe I should have seen equity myself <laughs> okay <laughs> okay I guess the jury is still out so we are in the equity section which like I said it's on the right side of the balance beam so we have total assets we have total liabilities and we have equity so um I, this is what I was describing here that equity would entail, could entail money that we owe to the owners of the company. So if you decided to um, use equity to fund your business, right? Have family members to, um, fund your business and you decide to give them a percentage of your business, that's equity. And at the end of the month or whatever agreements you have at the end of the quarter, you probably wanna pay them through dividends, that equity. Um, equity also some, um, includes retained earnings, which basically is your um, net income. The money, so at the end of every quarter, when you make your net income, you don't just go and spend it all. Sometimes you reinvest it into the company, and that's where we call it the retained earnings. You retain your earnings into the business. So that's where we have um, retail, retained earnings here. So we have total liabilities and equity here, which always has to bal um, balance with your total assets. If your numbers are off, you know that you have a problem. So every time you're doing your um, balance sheet, you always make sure the cardinal rule is your total assets should always um, um, be the same equal your total liabilities and shareholders equity. All right. I hope that was excited enough. Uh, moving on to the next um, um, financial statement. This is the cash flow statement. So the cash flow statement basically um, digs a little deeper. It gives you a view of how cash is being utilized within your business. So you want to make sure that understand how is cash flowing in and how is cash flowing out of your business. That should help you to make some sound um, business decisions such as perhaps you wanna scale up, you have 20 acres of cocoa farms, um, you wanna scale up and get um, 20 more. You look at your cash statement, say, how are we doing? Okay, we, 
do have a cash position is pretty good. So we actually have the money to be able to go in and either purchase or get a loan for um, to scale up on our business. So that's where you look at your cash um, um, you look at your cash flow statement. So within the cash flow statement, there are three um, main primary components to it. There's the cash flow from operating activities. There's the cash flow for investing activities, and there's a cash flow for financing activities. Then at the end of all that, try when you figure out all those things out, you get your net increase in tax, um, increase in increase or decrease in cash. If it's um, a decrease, that means that you are actually losing, you, you are losing a lot of money. But if it's positive, that means, of course, you're making good money, you have good cash flow balance. So um, I, I, um, if you are, I think if you, can, if you don't mind, give me five more minutes to dig a little deeper, just give an example of the three different categories, if that's okay. That's okay. So, um, thank you. So cash flow from operating activities, those will be um, basically the money that the revenue you are generating from the business, which include um, the cash you're receiving from your um, customers, such as money from your sale of your cocoa, um, cash you've paid to your employees, cash you've paid to your suppliers, if you've paid cash um, uh, for interest or taxes, all this would be considered um, um, cash flow from operating activities. Also, um, for cash flow for investing activities, that will be um, basically uh, monies that you spent in investing. So that's purchase of your big um, harvesters or big a uh, lot of extra land or um, sale of long term assets. So if you have land that you want to um, sell, you have your twenty acres and you want to sell five acres and make some more money. When you sell that um, five acres, the money, the additional cash you've gotten, that all be captured in the um, cash flow from investing activities. Then the last piece to it is your cash flow from financing activities, which would be your long debt payments, common stocks issued, and dividends paid. Then from that, you'll be able to know whether you're doing well from a cash um, standpoint or not. Then typically, what you do is you have your beginning cash from the um, cash from the beginning of the year and you compare that to um, cash from the end of the year so you you gained a little more cash so that means you are actually your position is good at the beginning of the year you had 20,000 Ghana CDs you made um, 1,800 Ghana CDs so at the end of the year your cash position is 21,800 Ghana CDs which is not which, which is a positive so that means your cash position is pretty solid. Um, in summary, yeah, that's um, what I wanted to share with everyone. If anybody has any questions, um, definitely feel free to send them through the chat or um, ask, and I'll be more than happy to discuss And them. I also put Sheila's email uh, in the chat in mm -hmm. mind for follow-up questions to this presentation. Wow, Sheila, I've learned a lot. You know, I'll, I'll source to an accountant for the financial statements <laughs> at Codes of Travel, but I feel like you will now help me get closer to understanding what he typically sent me. So I appreciate it. And uh, let's show some reactions to Sheila's presentation. Yay, thank you. I got a thumbs up from Kobe, so. <laughs> Yay, and clouds oh. and hearts and yeah. yeah. I think Joseph approved my presentation. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the main thing. Yeah. <laughs> I know, that's right? The main <laughs> thing. Yeah, all right. So this was the point that uh, one of our board members, Ona Kara, was supposed to present. He was gonna present by, you know, taking a financial statement document creating plots out of it, and also looking at competitor information, uh, such as annual reports, and would have done lovely plots with them. However, he ran into a personal emergency. And one of the things you do as a founder is to fill the gap. And so today, I'm being called to do that. Like I said, I only had this morning. And so this is going to be on, a fly, on the fly. What you see are 
clips of pictures of what is called a dashboard. A dashboard is the summary tool that executives, if you're a founder or an entrepreneur, you are the executive of your company, use to make decisions. Uh, because of its graphical component, it makes it very uh, friendly towards uh, executives rather than presenting just numbers. And so uh, I'm gonna try and re re replicate this dashboard, which are the pictures that you see uh, by going through a sales data file. Uh, I would have loved to customize it for the Ahafu example with Cocoa Timber and Plantains, uh, but did not have enough time to do that. So this is a sales data called North Winds Traders. Uh, it's found in Microsoft Access database. It comes with it uh, and you can pull an Excel file from there. So allow me to share my screen as I go through this demo of building a dashboard. So I'm gonna open my sales file. When you pull the data from Microsoft Excel, you just get a list of data. Typically, as your business grows, you want to track create a tracker of items like the product name, the sales you got, the employee ID, if you do have employees, even if it's just you, give yourself an ID. Uh, product ID corresponds to product name. Uh, customer ID is an identification for your customers. The year of purchase, the month, the quarter and then excel has additional functions like month of quarter and month name then there's the category of products that you are buying or that you are selling in this example the north wind traders are selling beverages dry fruits and nuts baked goods and mixes um the product is uh, please do not use annotate right now. Uh, the product is beer, dry plums, dry pears, apples, and whatnot. And then because this is a fictitious data, there are in customer names, but there are company AA symbolizing an actual company in real life. Then there's company D, company L, company H, C, 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 F, and what have you. And then there's which state was the order purchased from? We have Nevada, we have New York, we have Oregon, Illinois, Utah, Wisconsin, Oregon, and what have you. And then for this purpose, all the sales came from the United States. Uh, in your case, your country will be Ghana, and since Ghana doesn't use state, it will be regions if you wanted to create something like that. Now that you have your raw data, the next stop to creating a great dashboard is to build something called an Excel table. I'm going to quickly show how you do an Excel table. You click on the intersection between your row and your column. You, that highlights everything for you. And then you click on insert and you click on table. And then you can say, my table has headers. And in this case, it's true. My table has headers. The address, which is the dollar one colon dollar 1048576 represents the first cell address through to the very last cell address that will be at your bottom right corner. And so you click on OK. It says I'm about to do something that will 
affects things and I'm fine with that. Uh oh. <laughs> I should have listened to the prompt. All right. So that's how you create an Excel table. I can undo it so I can get my raw data back. Uh oh. Please bear with. Me. I got away with it one time. <laughs> All right. So it's back to its original because I don't need it. I already created an Excel table before we did. And notice the difference is that at the top, you see arrows in the Excel table. The Excel table puts a constraint on your raw data and makes sure there aren't any unnecessary blanks. And that's why an Excel table is needed. Now we're going to go to create a pivot table. To create a pivot table, you click on that intersection and it highlights everything again. Then you go to insert and then you click on pivot table. It's gonna give you some options, uh, whether you have to put the contents of the pivot table. Now hang tight if you don't understand what a pivot table because doing actually shows it than talking. Uh, so it's asking me, do I wanna put the pivot table in an existing worksheet or do I wanna put it in a new worksheet? And my answer is new. And this has begun creating the pivot tables. It just summarizes the table in a very great fashion, such that you are able to quickly summarize things. Again, I apologize for the annotate stuff that is on my screen. Maybe there's a way to clear it, but I wanna be into the presentation instead. Um, so I am going to pick uh, category and put it in rows. And you see the magic? As soon as I did that, the information has started summarizing on the pivot table here. Then I'm going to pick sales and put it at summation of values. And so it summarized my values by the category and it allows me to update the row name instead of the de facto, uh, the default title that it, it brought. But I also want to do another sales, which shows me the percentage of this number by the grand total, because just looking at the numbers, I am not able to have a relative sense of how these numbers are doing. And so I'm going to put sales again, after here. Now, the first sales variable, I don't need to do anything to it. But when I want to get the percentage, I need to do something else. I need to go to the value settings field and click on that small arrow and that opens it. Then you see that it chose the sum for the first one and it also chose the sum for the second one. But I do want it to show as a percentage. And so I go here, show values as no calculations, and then I choose percent of grand total. And that gives me the percent of the grand total. And now things are starting to make sense that probably this North Wind Trader uh, shop gets a lot of requests for beverages because we are seeing 43.48% leading the pack followed by jams, preserves, and, um, and um, I forget what, no, the 7%, the dried fruits and nuts. Uh, we can certainly uh, make a copy of this because it's easier. We don't have to recreate more pivot charts. I was an intent for progressive corporation and insurance company and tell you what, my manager wanted these pivot charts. So it's a very useful tool. 
once you learn it, you can put it on your resume that you know how to make pivot charts. Then you can, having made copies, now you can decide not to just look at category, but you may want to also look at uh, percent uh, employee. So I'm going to switch, take the category from here by dragging it and then clicking on the employee and bringing it to the rows. And so now I have employee and don't forget to quickly clean the title. Uh, we have, what else? We have, we can do product and company as well. So we click here, remove category uh, and bring customer name. And we starting to create great tables that immediately is giving us a sense of how this corporation is doing. Again, drag the category. I'm repeating stuff so you can you can you know have the benefit of of looking at stuff later on and being able to quickly retract these things now um, you can do something called top 10% usually the more your data set gets larger you want to constrain it to top 10, top five. And this table is a little longer than the rest. And so I'm going to constrain it to just top five or top 10. And it already gives me top 10. So I'll do top 10. And then there's a prompt by sum of sales. And then you see restrain. And when you count it, it's going to be just 10 items that you are viewing. So we, we've gone through pivot charts. Uh, repeated, repeated it for customer category or product. So now, okay, got it. Okay, okay, don't be mad. Create copies. Uh, I'll put demo. Okay, now you're going to make a copy of this sheet and you use move or copy, you, you right click the tab name, use move or copy, you do create a copy, you have to choose the one, it's create copies demo, and then check the create a copy box. And then you have the same thing repeated. Doing this allow the presentation to be more organized rather than doing all operations at once. That's why I'm taking my time to make copies as much as needed. And the next thing we are going to do is pivot charts. Pivot charts, as you can tell from the name of the other pivot tables, are charts that are based on pivot tables. And that's what we are going to do right now. So you click anywhere in one of your pivot tables and then you click, in, you don't click insert actually. If you have the right version of Excel, you should see pivot table tools and there is analyze. And then when you click on analyze, you need to find uh, pivot chat. And when you click on the pivot chat, it gives you an array of options. You can do column, line, pie chart, bar, area. There's a whole class on doing different charts. So I'm not gonna get through all of that, but for now, I want the combo chart. And not just that, the combo chart will be a bar chart and a line series graph that plots the sum of sales by the sum of sales to that is in the percentage. So it shows you right here at the bottom, sum of sales will be a column and sum of sales number two will be a line. But I want to check here, I want it to be a secondary axis. A secondary axis allows two variables or two columns to have their own axes. And so I click on that and I click on okay. 
And just like that, I now have a chat. So you can already tell that while I eyeballed the values, the blue spike is for beverages. And the next one is probably jams and preserves. And so the visualization is already allowing you to see what you are supposed to see. And that's why executives love dashboards because I don't have time to be at the ground level if I manage, like Honorable Ng said, he manages 40 workforce, 40 employees. He doesn't have to go and talk to everyone to know how sales is going. He should be able to have a chat like this that quickly allows to look at his numbers on a daily or weekly or monthly basis as he chooses. And these numbers start to really bring in uh, the, the power of these things, of these dashboards. And so we'll continue more dashboards, pivot chats, column, combo, check secondary access, boom. We have another one. I'm dragging to make sure we get a, a better view of the graphs. And if it's too much, I will reduce it. And some of the design principles that you've learned today should even help you to do awesome design with uh, dashboards. Then you have analyze, pivot. Again, the repetition is for your benefit. So you see this as many times, you are seeing it four times and you are well on your way. Drag so we can see stuff a little clearer and need to save so that when you email me, I can quickly send the dashboard and you can continue with the learning process. And then we have our three, uh, our four chats. Let's continue to add in slices and timelines. Add in slices, we make a copy of this, create pivot chat, create a copy. And now we have a copy, but we call it add slices and timeline demo. Uh, again, it makes it cleaner. That's why I'm taking the trouble of copying things. And the slicers uh, you get by, again, OK, so you select any pivot table. Let's select the first one and then click on analyze, uh, click on filter, and then it says insert slicer. And then you are gonna check the slices you want this to go. And we are gonna include, include a category, product, customer, and the other one was employee. Slicer sounds like, you know, bread slicers. You have a slice and it's part of a whole. And so these slicers really allow the executives to drill down or zoom in into different levels of that. So we have four slicers for our four paper charts and four. The thing we have to do is um, insert more rows so we have enough space to do, and the more you choose all, you get the double of whatever you, you select. So now I can pick the category slicer and resize it to what I want. I can pick the employee slicer and reshape it. I can click the product and resize it. I can click this. 
and resize it as well. What does the slicer do? I'm glad you asked. So remember when we talked about beverages being the highest category? Immediately I do beverages. See, the thing has just zeroed in on beverages. And so beverages, I see the sales. I also see how it affects other tables. So that is the drill down capability that the slices allow you. If you want to get rid of it, it's this funnel icon with the red X button and then it checks off. Let's say I want to see Andrew Sanchini's uh, drill down and their employee. I do the same thing and it brings this out. Then there is product. If I want to look at beer, uh, if I want to look at company D and on and on it goes. Now, I may even say, I want a map or a timeline. Uh, that is also easy to do. I don't know if we have the time, but let me quickly see. I will click on this pivot table, click on insert, analyze, and then where the slicer is next to it is the timeline. The only variables that qualify for timeline are date, and that's why you only have the order date. And so I click on that and boom, now I have a timeline. And so again, I can insert and create space at the top. At the top and I can put my timeline. So that if I want to see January, I just click on that. If I want to see February, that March, it should be changing, but February and then go back. Now there are many tools for doing dashboards. My personal favorite is Tableau, but Tableau has a cost and Excel is free and we're partnering with Microsoft, so. No, 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 no. Um, and, uh, and, uh, I do not think. Please, someone is off on. mute. Yeah. Please go off mute. Uh, so we have our timeline also done. One of people's favorites is, um, it's what we call, um, hold on, let me find a sales analysis, a map. People love maps in presentations. So let's see how we do a map. We just highlight the state and the region. And we go to uh, insert. Mm, maybe not insert, hold on. Let me look at my quick notes here. All right, I wish I would have gotten to show you some maps, but um, it will take time from the prompts that I saw uh, putting our workshop be, be beyond its um, timeline. And uh, I hope you've learned more about dashboards and how to organize your information quickly and to have drill down capabilities uh, throughout your presentation. Thank you for the audience. And I think we are running into a closing moment for the entire program. Uh, let me see, someone prompted me about what I could have been missing from the maps. I'm going to try again uh, quickly because I do want you to see a map. All right, so go back to the sales, yes, and maps, what I couldn't see. And immediately we have a nice map. So I can grab a copy of it and take it to the art slicers and put our map somewhere here. Again, we'll have to create space for it. 
And don't forget about retitling your charts. It's very important. Uh, this can be a bigger map and you can call it sales data by US sales, US states, sales data by USA states. And that's a little bit about dashboarding. You've learned a lot of presentation techniques. You have to somehow bring them all to your dashboard. And I tell you what, executives really love people who can build dashboards. Uh, so thank you for the audience and Kwabna, thanks for the help with the map. Oh, I see the chat. All right. Uh, all right. Okay. Any questions? Hopefully this wasn't too over the top, but this was great. I enjoyed hanging out with you. Are there any others who joined later that will need to be introduced? But if not, we are at one minute and yay, we were on time and everything went great and our presenters, the technology, this has been awesome. I've been fulfilled. Yes, show some emotions <laughs> with your reactions in the final minute. Yay. Yay. <laughs> All right, have a good one and see you next two weeks for the hybrid series of workshops. It's gonna be power packed. And don't forget hashtagging on social media as well. And Carla and Kobe, thank you for partnering with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you all, thank you all, thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Oh. Their comments are making me smile. Thank you. Thank you all. See you on the six. See you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good evening. Night, 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 night. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, Nabia. Thanks, Carla. Yeah, we would. <laughs> I'm going to end the meeting. Good night. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Proper Drew. <laughs> that was a good one. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Yes, don't forget to subscribe to Baobab. They help us with social media alongside the Intifo group and um, 2112 charity. I think it's polite for me to be the last person to leave the room. So please drop off. Okay, so I will drop. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I wanted to ask something. I don't know if I'll call you on WhatsApp. Yeah, we this. have to talk. Give me, I need to relax and then maybe tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So maybe when I wake up tomorrow. Yeah, something I want in your presentation, you said I wanted to see how maybe I can I can benefit from it. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm. So tomorrow maybe you talk about it. So bye bye. Bye. Bobby, thank you very much for involving me in this thing. Bye bye. 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 All right, I'm going to drop the call. One, two, three.